Good morning and welcome to the Dental Board of California quarterly meeting. Today is February 8th, 2018. I would like to ask all of us to please turn ourselves to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid feedback noise. You may notice board members accessing their laptops during the meeting. They are using the laptop solely to access the board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Dental Board of California. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak to that item, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. Depending on the number of people who would like to testify on a partic particular agenda item, a time limit may be imposed. We ask all speakers to please stay on topic, and if a time limit is determined to be necessary, keep your comments to within that time limit. I would like to now call the meeting to order and ask the board's secretary, Ms. Chappelle Ingram, to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. President. Burton? Here. Chan? Here. Chappelle Ingram? Here. Lai? Here. Lay? Medina? Here. Mora? Here. Stewart? Here. Witcher? Here. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Before we get started, if uh, I can remind board members that we only have nine board members in attendance today. We need to have eight at the table for a quorum, so please be mindful when you leave the room of if somebody else is already out that you uh, would stay behind. Um, and that would be very much appreciated. Uh, good morning. I am honored and humbled to serve as the Dental Board President during 2018. Staff is gearing up for another busy year and I would like to thank each board member in advance for continuing, continuing to study the issues in the board meeting material prior to the meetings and for attending the meetings and participating in the discussions. As a team, we will accomplish much this year. 2018 will be all about the Sunset Re Review Report that will be submitted to the legislature by the end of the year probably by December 1. At the May meeting, board members will begin the process by reviewing the issues that were outlined in the legislature in the last Sunset Review Report and the board's response to a, each issue and identifying new issues that should be addressed. In addition to the Sunset Review Report, I would like to see the board take, a, take an active role in getting the word out to consumers and licensees about the opioid use and abuse in the nation and the state. I will encourage the pres Prescription Drug Use Committee to enhance the list of resources available on the board's website. And to take a step back and to see if there is more that we can do as a board to help stop this national crisis. We will also try to get the word out about the requirement that all licensees holding an active dental license and a DEA license are required to have registered for cures by July 1, 2016. There are currently five vacancies on the board. The governor's office is aware of this and appointments are in the works. The board requires eight members to attend a meeting in order to establish a quorum and conduct business. There will not be a joint meeting of the Dental Assisting Council and full board at this meeting because we were unable to get a quorum of uh, DAC members. The agenda items relating to dental assisting will be discussed during the full board meeting. There are currently three vacancies on the DAC, two faculty positions and the board member RDA. The governor's office is aware of the RDA member vacancy. The board has posted the recruitment information for the two faculty positions. I have appointed a subcommittee of Ms. Fran Burton, public member and vice president of the board, uh, Dr. Bruce Witcher. To review the applications and conduct telephone interviews and to bring recommendations back to the full board for appointments to fill these vacancies. 
This concludes my opening remarks. Are there any questions? In addition, staff will be passing out revised agendas for tomorrow. The numbering of items on the agenda for tomorrow did not correlate to the tabs, memos, and the printed material. This error only occurred in the printed meeting materials. Therefore, staff is providing a new agenda which will reflect the correct agenda item numbers. The agenda and meeting materials past, posted on the internet are correct. At this time, uh, I would like to take agenda item eight out of order and introduce Ms. Linda Schneider, Senior Assistant General, Attorney General, who will provide the board with a report on the accusations prosecuted on behalf of the Dental Board of California. Welcome, Ms. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. President and honorable members of the board. I appreciate being invited here to address you today. My name is Linda Schneider. I'm the Senior Assistant Attorney General of the Licensing Section, California Office of the Attorney General. And I'm accompanied today by Supervising Deputy Attorney General Gregory Salute, who's the former liaison deputy to the Dental Board. Okay, with respect to the report, I'd like to discuss it in five segments. First of all, I'll tell you some background information about the report. Second, some general observations about all 38 agencies of the Department of Consumer Affairs that the report concerns. Third, how the data was collected for the report. Then, how the report is presented and Lastly, and probably nearest and dearest to your heart, is the statistics for the Dental Board of California. So first of all, with respect to background, Senate Bill 467 was enacted in 2015 that established Business and Professions Code Section 312.2. And this is the provision of the Business and Professions Code that requires this annual report. It's a report to be filed annually concerning the um, Department of Consumer Affairs licensing agencies that are represented by the licensing section and the health quality enforcement section of the Attorney General's office. Between the two sections, we represent 38 different agencies of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, notably absent is the, do, the um, Bureau of Real Estate that has its own counsel. So we don't report on that one, and that's not covered by 312.2. Um, <clears throat> the data in the report is for fiscal year 2016-17, so the data collection period ended on June 30th, 2017. The report was required by law to be published January 1st of 2018. This was the first report that we have published and it will be re uh, published annually each year thereafter. The full report looks like this. In your board materials, you received one page of the report which is the dental board's section of the report. So the licensing section and health quality enforcement section of the Attorney General's office represents the 38 different licensing agencies in numerous kinds of matters. They are all administrative law matters or related to administrative law matters. And the lion's share of the matters or the, or the crux of them are the board's enforcement matters. So, the report concerns only accusation matters, which is the core of each board's enforcement. Um, uh, we handle lots of different kinds of work, and 40% of our work in general is for accusation matters. The other types are generally statement of issues, petitions to revoke probation, citations, interim suspension orders, judicial review and appeals, that sort of thing. 
So in, during the data collection period, fiscal year 2016-17, there were a total of 3,097 referrals by the licensing agencies to the health quality enforcement and licensing sections of our office. Of that number, 83 of the matters were from the dental board. These are accusation matters. Less than 2.7% of the cases that were referred were rejected. Rejection is when we find there's insufficient evidence to prove a case and therefore prosecution is declined. In 10% of the cases referred to our office, again, the entire group of cases, uh, approximately 10% of them required further investigation. This is an important issue because we um, can't prosecute a case until the investigation is complete, and if investigation is incomplete, further investigation must be done, and it delays the process. Then, in, during the fiscal year, we had 3,384 cases that were adjudicated by our office. Now, you might notice that the referral rate was 3,097 and the adjudication rate was 3,384 and you may wonder why the numbers don't match. The reason for this is that the data is, or not the data, the cases are all moving at a different rate. Every case has its own um, uh, calendar and is going to, some cases are longer, some are shorter, some are opened in one year, others are opened in a different year. So because things are always moving, it's a, basically a, a what happened during that year. So the number of referrals that came in and the number of cases that were adjudicated are not necessarily the same cases. Some may be the same, but some of the cases adjudicated in the fiscal year may have been received the year before or even two years before. So that's why the numbers don't match. Um, adjudication, what does that mean? It means basically when the work of the Attorney General's office is completed. And this happens in basically four ways. Number one is if a respondent defaults that's adjudicated and the case goes back to the board for final decision. Settlement, again, if a stipulation is signed, it goes to the board for its consideration. Third is hearing before an administrative law judge. And the fourth way is if a case is withdrawn. An accusation is filed, but it's later determined that it should be withdrawn. There may also be multiple adjudications on a single case. This happens in two different ways. Number one, some of our cases have more than one licensee involved in the case. It doesn't really happen for the dental board, but we represent a lot of different clients. So for example, Bureau of Automotive Repair cases and Board of Pharmacy cases often have different licensees involved in the same case. So there may be more than one adjudication that way. The second way, and this would be applicable to the dental board, is when um, an adjudication is not accepted as a final decision by the board. The board exercises its discretion to not accept a settlement or to not adopt a proposed decision or order reconsideration. So in those cases, we go what I colloquially call go into extra innings and then uh, take the case to hearing if a settlement has been not adopted or you know, do what's necessary to get the resolution for the board. Again, in general numbers, approximately 60% of the cases overall handled by our office, the accusation cases, are resolved by settlement for the board, that number is about 71%. 25% of our cases overall are resolved by default. For the board, that number is 11.5%. And 12% of the cases overall go to hearing for resolution. And for the board, it's about 10%.
Turning now to the report and where does the data come from, um, we have a case management system in the Office of the Attorney General and there is a customization designed for every section of the Attorney General's office. We have three divisions in our office and many sections and we do many different kinds of work. So the customization is established for the licensing and health enforcement section so that we will be able to collect the data necessary to report for the legislature, the governor, and the Department of Consumer Affairs. And also, and to us more importantly, is so that we can get the work done. And so we track every case by step by step by step, and we use our case management system to help us stay on task and keep every case moving forward as quickly as we can. We handle lots of cases for lots of different agencies, so it's not an easy task. We need all the tools that we can uh, gather together to be able to deliver for all of our clients. So every user of the system is required to enter data in the system um, according to the rules that have been set, according to the customization for the section, and everybody has a high degree of accountability data appropriately and at the time the events occur. Um, we also have a process where our paralegals do auditing and validation of the report is prepared to make sure everything is accurate. Then with respect to the presentation of the report, you don't have the full report. There's a few pages at the front of the report that describe some of the information we're providing to you today and also talk about how the report is set up. And the way it is set up is so that each one of our different client agencies has a separate page in the report to report the data. And that's the page that has provided to you for the dental board. <coughs> each of, as I mentioned, each of our clients is very different. We have you know, Bureau of Automotive Repair, Cosmetology, the Dental Board, Chiropractic Board, many, many different agencies. Their work is the same in the sense that it's licensed discipline, enforcement work, but the subject matters are very different. For each individual agency can be different as well. So we chose to present the data for each individual agency with the concept that it should be compared one agency to itself year after year as opposed to the agencies being compared to each other because they're so different. And that's why there's a separate page for each agency. Now turning to the dental board page itself, it's broken down into two basic sections, table one and table two. Although at the top of the report, you'll see some basic information, the number of licensees, et cetera, and that data is taken from the 2016 Department of Consumer Affairs annual report. We provided that information, again, to give the reader some context about the size of the board because, again, they are all very different. So table one basically presents information about the number of cases. It reports counts pursuant to 312.2 subdivision A. And the specific things that are listed, one through seven, are those seven items that have been required by subdivision A of the code section. So as we've already mentioned, the number of accusation matters referred during fiscal year 2016-17 were 83. And then the number of adjudications was 113. As, and as I have already described, it's because you're really talking about different cases. They're not the same ones. Um, the number of cases that required further investigation in this fiscal year, you see 12 cases, that's about 15%. So 
So ideally, we'd like to see that number be as low as possible because when a case needs further investigation after it's been referred, it's going to go a little slower. When further investigation is requested by our office, it, uh, the request is made back to the board. The board's investigators will then you know, collect whatever information is necessary to complete the investigation so that we can pursue um, an accusation. So during the time between the request and the receipt of the investigation, the case is left open in our office. We have different processes between licensing and health quality enforcement. In health quality enforcement, they close their cases if a request for investigation is made, and then it's reopened at a later time. But in our cases, they're held open. We do that so that we can be available and working with the investigator to the extent necessary during that for their investigation. And then when it's received, we'll go ahead and take the reins again and get the accusation on file. Um, the number of accusations withdrawn is in, in this year was six matters, and that's about 5%. <clears throat> accusations are filed when there's sufficient evidence and there's established violation of the law or a cause for discipline. But things come up during the pendency of a case where we learn more, and particularly often we learn more from the respondent's point of view during the litigation. And so sometimes the judgment is made that the accusation shouldn't be pursued, and then it's withdrawn. That happens in everybody's cases, so it's nothing to be uh, of uh, nothing of particular interest, I guess. Then when you go to table two, we are talking about averages, and that's the average number of days. This is pursuant to subdivision B of the report. When we talk about the averages, you'll see in the, re in the um, table that there is mean, median, standard deviation, and count. Mean is what we typically consider to be the average, or you total up all the numbers, you know, the matters in a set, and then you divide it by the number of matters. Uh, median is the center point in an ordered set of data. So basically, what is the, the middle number? Uh, standard deviation provides context in statistics, and that is if the standard deviation is low, it means that the, um, the data points are close to the mean. And if the standard deviation number is high, it means they're spread out a lot uh, 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 far away from the, the average. And so it means, in other words, if you have a high standard of deviation, you have a lot of matters that are sort of outliers or far out on one side or the other. That's as much as I know about statistics, so I hope you don't have any questions on that one. Okay. So then turning to the numbers themselves. The first one talks about the accusations filed and the number of days from receipt in our office until the accusation is filed. Now, the, what, what this entails is review of the matter by a deputy attorney general after the matter is received. Then the accusation being prepared by the deputy, having it sent to the board for filing, the board's review of the accusation, the board's filing by Ms. Fisher signing it as the executive officer, and then the accusation being returned to our office. At the point in time when the executive officer signs the accusation, that stops the clock for this parameter. That's the date of the filing of the accusation. So we record that in our data case management system. <clears throat> the second one is 
how, much, how many days it takes from the time a case is referred to our, to our office until the accusation is prepared when there's been a request for further investigation. So remember I told you the cases are left open during the time that further investigation is conducted. So this period of time is always going to be a, you know, a more lengthy time. But we're measuring here not to the point when the pleading is filed by the executive officer's signature, but up until the point in time when the pleading is prepared and sent to the dental board for its review of the accusation and signature. So those two parameters, number one and two, are a little bit different in terms of what they're measuring. But all of the cases in number one were also in number two. In other words, all, all the cases in number two go into number one. So the cases that took longer because they required further investigation go into those averages that are reported in number one. So the more cases you have that require further investigation, requiring longer time, the higher the average will be in number one for how long it takes to get the accusation filed. To us, getting the accusation on file is a very important step in the process because it's the beginning. We can't get the case adjudicated until the accusation has been filed. So we would like to get it done as quickly as possible, get the case moving. Once it gets filed, then it's served, and then either it gets resolved by settlement or default or it's scheduled for hearing. Then the next one is um, you know, how long it takes to, on average, for a stipulated settlement. Settlement can happen at any time during the litigation process. So it's not surprising that it, it's a fairly high average. Lots of times um, a respondent will hold on to the very last minute and then when the case is ready to go to hearing, the respondent will decide, okay, instead of going to hearing, I'd rather just sign the stipulated settlement. So oftentimes they happen later. Once in a while, you know, we're able to get a settlement more quickly. And then the defaults also, defaults happen in two different ways and those both of them go into the averages. One is when a respondent fails to file a notice of defense within 15 days after the accusation is served. The other is if a respondent fails to appear at hearing. Those are very different points in time. More of the defaults happen for failure to file the notice of defense, which is on the shorter end, but some happen on the longer end too when the case is actually set for hearing and then the respondent doesn't show up. So those are the kind of numbers that go into that average. <coughs> and then the amount of days on average that it takes to get a case to hearing after the hearing has been set by the Office of Administrative Hearings. That's reported on average as 295. So that's the um, period of time it takes um, to get the case queued up on the Office of Administrative Hearings calendar for the particularized case. So that's sort of an overview, and what can we conclude from this data? Um, well, what we do know is what can be measured can be improved, and I think that's sort of the point of the legislature asking for us to prepare this report. Ever since the Department of Consumer Affairs established the Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative in 2010, all of the agencies have been focused on trying to really um, it get the disciplinary, disciplinary process completed as expeditiously as possible. Because if licensees are in fact unqualified, incompetent, negligent, dangerous, 
um, we don't want to have them licensed because that's a risk to consumers. So the faster we can impose discipline, the better. The CPEI established a goal of 540 days. That's 18 months. And that's a goal that goes all the way from receipt of the complaint at the agency through the investigative process, through expert review in the case of the dental board, almost all cases require an expert, then to our office for prosecution, through hearing at the Office of Administrative Hearings, then back to the board for the board's deliberation and final decision. That's a lot to do. And keep in mind as well that the adjudicative process requires due process. So fairness to the respondent and giving the respondent enough time to prepare a defense is imperative and having enough time to be able to fully evaluate the case, make their decisions, do their investigation, and hire their experts to be prepared for the case is all part of what needs to be done as well from the, the respondent's point of view. So there's a lot to be done to litigate a case to conclusion. So whether the 540 days is um, a, an appropriate goal for every agency, it probably is not. Um, some agencies have licensees that have less invested in their license than does a dentist or even a RDA. Um, some of the licensees don't have to go to school for a long time. They don't have to invest all that money in their education. They don't have to take tests to become licensed. So those kind of folks, maybe, you know, the structural pest control guy who sprays around your house, you know, so you, the ants don't come in, doesn't have quite the same invested in the license as does a dentist. The bug guy might disagree. I don't know. But they're not all the same is my point. Also, in cases like the cases brought by the dental board, um, people in the profession of dentistry tend to be fairly high paid. They have a lot at stake if they lose their license, and they're most often represented. I hate to say this, but one of the things attorneys get paid to do is take time. From a defense point of view, time is a strategy. So the longer you can keep a case going, the better it is for their client. Just saying. <laughs> so that's another reason that dental board cases are, you know, they're hard fought. Um, they're well represented, and um, they almost always have attorneys. So those are things to keep in mind. We strive to adjudicate our cases as expeditiously as possible. We're always looking at ways that we can do it more quickly, balancing the needs of all of our clients. Um, we're in it because of consumer protection, and we want to do the very best we can for the consumers of California and for our clients like you, the dental board. Do you have any questions? Thank you for that, Linda. I do have one. Uh, the, the number you, number six, um, 295 days, I think you used the term get the case queued up on the calendar. What are some of the factors that go into taking that amount of time to get something on, the, on a calendar? Okay. So um, there's, there are various factors that go into it. First thing is the Office of Administrative Hearings requires meet and confer between the opposing attorneys. So our deputy attorneys general and respondents counsel have to negotiate out a hearing date. So that's part of it. And part, wh what goes into that is attorneys' schedules. So all attorneys carry a caseload of cases, and they're not going to be free until, you know, whenever they have a hole in their calendar to be able to put the case in. And then there's also that preparation time that's required 
by the defense primarily, as well as the, the prosecution, but we have a bit of an advantage because we filed the case, so we're familiar with the case much more quickly than the respondent is. Then there's the Office of Administrative Hearings calendar, and when that um, calendar is available for a hearing date. Then the other part is witness availability, when the witnesses are available to testify. And then another part of it is continuances. If a hearing is continued, then it's going to take longer for the hearing to commence. So those are the main factors. I probably missed some, didn't I? The only thing I would add is, you know, with dental cases, of course, particularly dentists, um, usually a multi-day hearing and so a three or four day hearing, especially where you have multiple patients. So when you're talking about that type of time, that means our deputy has to block off three or four days, OAH has to block off three, they call it a long cause hearing, much more difficult to calendar because of OAH's judge availability and, and our offices of availability. So um, does that apply to a, RDA conviction case or something like that? Of course not, but it applies to, it drags on because, it could drag on because of the long cause hearings where you have a dental case with multiple patients, et cetera. You also, like Linda said, have to incorporate the dental board expert schedule as well, et cetera, so. Okay. How often do you, do, uh, do you use uh, like immediate suspension? or suspend practice until uh, you can get to the case, let's just say in a very egregious or, or a semi-egregious matter, how often can you implement that? Let's just say, you know, a, uh, a group of um, patients uh, complain against a doctor, can you stop them, uh, stop him from practicing immediately or temporarily until we go, we go to hearing? Um, yes, it's possible. It's a small number of cases, and the reason reasons that go into that are that, number one, we would have to be able to meet our burden of proof to show that there is an immediate risk of harm to the public if the licensee was not immediately suspended. And the other part of it is we would have to put all of our evidence together to be able to um, present the petition to the Office of Administrative Hearings that has to be prepared in all declarations and you know p paperwork petitions etc which is a uh, and then the case has to go to hearing within a very short period of time thereafter so it's very front-loaded in terms of time and cost and being able to meet the burden of proof. So these factors are um, uh, always in consideration and we consult with the board's enforcement staff in order to make the decisions about which cases we should employ that kind of a procedure. So that means the uh, enforcement can um, ask for that. So it gives them more power to do that. Yes, yes. It, it's usually um, considered by a request from enforcement staff that it be um, evaluated that way, although it happens both ways. Our, our deputy, when they begin working on a case, if they see something that they feel is really meets the criteria and is a serious risk of harm, they'll recommend it to the board staff as well. Thank you. I believe Dr. Morrow had a question. Yes, I also want to thank you for spending your time giving us this report. It's been very informative. Uh, my question has to do with table one, item number three. Do you have any data that would identify to us what the most frequent uh, areas of missing information is from our investigative uh, reports that require a request for additional information. Um, yeah, I believe I believe so, Dr. Morrow. Um, one of one of the main areas, not just with the dental board, although the dental board's really good at it, but um, 
is the medical records issue. Sometimes we have incomplete medical records. Um, sometimes, so that would be one, yeah, the, the uh, dental records, especially from possibly subsequent treaters, et cetera, may not be complete or we may learn. Um, one other area is um, respondent. I, we just had this happen the other day. Um, a respondent, when he was contacted, um, submitted partial records. When we based our case on the partial records, uh, the case had to do with um, fraud, fraudulent uh, billings, et cetera. Well, it turns out he had a whole bunch of other records on his computer that he never submitted. And so we had to submit that for further investigation to obtain true and correct copies of records from billing software, et cetera, from third parties um, to verify his claims that, because he said he couldn't download it off the computer. So those are things, incomplete medical records is the main thing. Um, sometimes there's, um, we learn through uh, uh, respondents' defense that there's other witnesses, et cetera, that, have, that we have to go obtain statements from. Sometimes the, the, the um, patient submits incomplete information, we have to go obtain information more from the patient, et cetera. So those are kind of areas where, those are some of the areas where we, we need to obtain further investigation, but of course there's more as well. Um, we don't have data as to, you know, how many of certain categories of things like Greg mentioned happen. So um, we only ha keep a statistic on the number of times we have to make the request, but we don't have like sub-statistics on what the nature of the request was. Well, my, one of my, obviously one of my reasons for asking that question was to be able to provide to us what we need to be more looking at more specifically, almost a checklist of saying, have we done this, have we done that, have we done that? Because that's an area where our investigative team and our enforcement team could be more vigilant in reducing that time because we do a more complete uh, investigation and reporting of that of that data. But we need to know where where are we not fulfilling our responsibility. And uh, Dr. Morrow, to respond to that, um, we are in the pro staff is in the process of reviewing uh, the information we get back from the Attorney General's office, stipulations, uh, settlements, um, decisions that are adopted by the board with staff so that they know, they can learn from what's gone before them and not have to recreate the wheel. We have, Carlos and I have also talked about checklists going forward in terms of um, what happens in the process. Um, Carlos and I actually have been reviewing the material recently before it goes to the Attorney General's office because um, for me, reading something, I may find, I may ask questions myself because uh, I'm reading it for the first time and I haven't been working the case, so to speak. And so some things are more obvious to me that may not have been obvious to the investigator at the time. And so I'll say, why is this missing? Where are we going with this? Why didn't this interview happen? So we're in the process of really reviewing our whole process and sharing that information with our investigators so that they can be more informed and learn along the way of what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, on that, Linda, I just wanted to ask, you were, to, you were quoting what percentage of uh, our cases are resolved by STIPs, defaults, and go to hearing. Are those percentages based on your total number that you receive, or are those based on our, num our total number that we send to you? So in essence, when you say 75% of uh, the cases are resolved by STIPs, is that 75% of our cases that go to you? or 75% of the 3,000 cases that you get for the whole department? The numbers I was giving you are based upon the fiscal year for the report, and they're based upon the adjudications that are reported for, um, in, in the report. So of the 113 adjudications, those are the rough percentages of the way those different adjudications occurred. I see Dr. Witcher. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, just very quickly. It's nice to hear you're doing some quality control on your data. It's uh, one thing to collect numbers and another thing to make sure they're any good. And so I think that's absolutely key. And, and it's good to know you have a high level of accountability for your reporting. I mean, we're, we're involved in some reporting kind of efforts, and those questions come up. I'll tell you something. It's a brutal process. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to make sure you've got it right. It really does. So yeah, thank I, you for that. Yeah, and I would just add, kind of seconding some of the comments here, that maybe we could get a little more consistency between the way our enforcement unit reports numbers to us and the way that you report them. Because there is some discrepancy in some of the numbers. And, and I, are we, I don't think as part of our report, we're tracking uh, cases returned for further investigation. Uh, so that might be something we want to look at. I mean, if you know, we'll, we'll take that up later, but just a comment. We're happy to work with the board on it. And a you know, project like this really helps us to get closer together on things that we really need to focus on. So another thing that we do for um, the Department of Consumer Affairs and many of our clients is training. And in training of investigators is one of the big things that we do. If, they, if we feel there's a need to do that, we'd be happy to provide that service. Or if it's just maybe more issue spotting on the particular types of issues like Greg was mentioning, uh, we can focus in on that. And for example, on records, records are a very delicate issue. Um, the board generally obtains authorizations from patients, but in s many of the cases we see that's not always the case. So that's always the best way to get records, but if they're not obtained through an authorization by the patient, it, it has a lot of other legal issues that we have to deal with. So things like that, um, that can, we can help you know people focus on to make sure they get it right. and. Whatever problems we see, we would be happy to amalgamate and make sure that we're addressing them with the board's investigators. Just quickly, it's reassuring to hear Greg says the dental board does a good job on this. <laughs> very good job. So, our, The investigators work very hard and they do a very good job and we've worked with them uh, over the years and they're all, they're all very good so you, sh you should be proud of what they do, really. All right, anything else from the board? Seeing none, uh, let me just echo Dr. Morrow, and thank you so much, both of you, Greg, Linda, for those, that very nice presentation. Much appreciated, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it as well. Pu I'm sorry, public comment? I think we're good. Thank you. We're moving to the approval of the November 2-3, 2017 board meeting minutes. Any concerns, corrections? President Stewart, I move acceptance of the minutes as presented. So we have a first and a second. Uh, all those, and let's see, do we do this by roll call? Yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry again, public comment? Morning, Mr. President, board members. Uh, I'm Anthony Lum. I'm the new executive officer of the Dental Hygiene Committee of California. Just a quick request in page 11, agenda item 12, and it's just a correction for the record. In the second paragraph, it reads, on behalf of the DHCC president, um, Susan, Miss Susan Good, She's actually our current new president that just started January 1st. 
So if our prior president's name could be inserted in there instead, Noel Kelsch. And then just a minor correction too, um, in the first paragraph, I was acting, uh, I wasn't acting, I was in interim. So if those could be considered, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So with those corrections, we'll call the roll. Jan. Yeah. Chappelle Ingram. Lai. Yeah. Lay. Yeah. Medina. Yes. Morrow. Yeah. Stewart. Yeah. Witcher. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, we have a quorum. Moving on to item four, I believe uh, Sarah's going to handle this for us. Good morning. My name is Sarah Wallace. I'm the Assistant Executive Officer. And I wanted to introduce today Kevin Driscoll. He is the Department of Consumer Affairs Budget Officer. And we've asked him to come and speak to some of the questions that came up as a result of the last meeting. And he also has some good news to share. Yes. <laughs> so I'll start with the budget report that we have currently in your packet. At the time this report was written, these were um, estimated expenditures. Uh, at the time, fiscal system had not closed out fiscal month one yet. And so the numbers that are provided in our packets are based on information provided from other resources that the board, uh, that DCA was able to pull together. We're on track right now. We've um, spent approximately 44% of our total dentistry fund appropriation at the close of fiscal month six and approximately 37% of the state dental assisting appropriation by the close of fiscal month six, which was December 30th of 2017. And so we've provided the estimated numbers in the packet along with fund conditions. At the last meeting, there were questions relating to the fiscal system and how fees were assessed to each of the boards and bureaus. Board staff has addressed those questions in the board meeting packets. Essentially, fiscal charges all of the departments within the state of California a certain fee. And so those fees are included in the packet on page three of the memo. In addition to what was reported under question two, there are additional expenditures that the state dentistry, dental assistant fund incurred. So in addition to the 57,000 that incurred by the state dentistry fund in 1213, 8,000 was incurred by the state dental assisting fund. In 13 14, 53,000 was incurred by the state dentistry fund. Again, state dental assisting fund incurred 8,000. In fiscal year 14 15, the state dentistry fund was incurred 10,000. And the D dental assisting fund incurred 2,000. In 15 16, dentistry fund incurred 23,000. And the dental assisting fund incurred 3,000. In fiscal year 16 17, the state dentistry fund incurred 17,000 and the dental assisting fund incurred 3,000. Um, now, keep in mind, as the at the time this report was written, these were estimated expenditures and I'm gonna hand it over to Kevin. He also has some additional information regarding the arbitration process. That question came up at the last board meeting and then he also has an update on the fiscal system with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Good morning, Mr. President and board members. Um, this is my first time in front of you guys. Again, my name is Kevin Driscoll. I'm the budget officer I'm with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, I began uh, my, my role there in last May. So I'm making my rounds and getting in front of all the other boards and, and yourselves included. Um, and going to Sarah's point, uh, with the fiscal system, you know, there has been challenges and there's been concerns um, voiced from the board. However, I would like to to say that fiscal month one has been successfully closed. Um, a full complete report out of the system will be delivered um, tomorrow or the beginning of next week um, to your staff. They have uh, successfully requested the close of fiscal month two process that began last week. And fiscal month three was requested to close yesterday. 
Um, so they are starting to make some significant progress with the system. Um, the system is absolutely working. It's capturing all expenditures, revenues, reimbursements. Um, it's a, it's a just a different environment than the CalSTAR system as, as we're um, all learning in the infancy of a system such as a large complex IT system as this is. Um, it is the book of record for the state of California for um, procurements, contracts, accounting, cash management, and budgeting. Um, so there has been some, some challenges along the way, but we, we have successfully been able to, to cross some of the hurdles. Um, in December, the executive office did get involved and we were able to escalate up some of the issues that the, the department was facing and closing through the month end close process and worked with the executive office of the fiscal agency themselves to help elevate up some of our um, issues. There was a number of agencies that went live with us beginning last July 1. I want to say it was about 16 or 17 other agencies that went live onto the system um, following some of the other first wave one and wave two um, bigger agencies. There's a bigger push coming this July 1 with the remaining 64 some agencies coming online in July 1. So we're actually kind of fortunate to be ahead of the curve of that workload coming online to fifth scale. And that kind of created some of the, the challenges and hurdles in getting some of the issues addressed, just the sheer volume of other agencies going on live. Um, but we were able to successfully mitigate some of those. And so what we're seeing now is a waterfall approach to closing those fiscal months to be caught up. And we're anticipating to be fully caught up by the end of March, early, early April, you know, with FM6, FM7 reports coming out of the system that are very easily digestible, um, formatted correctly so you guys, so the board will be able to understand what the report is showing because it is very different than CalSTARS as, as we've learned. Um, you know, going back to your guys, to the actual, you know, fund status itself, uh, again, the state dentistry fund is trending very much as, as you were last year and those are the things that we looked for. The data that's presented in the reports are extracts from the system, uh, the real-time data from the actual system itself. It's not a, we don't consider it a report yet because the fiscal, the month in close process needs to occur to actually produce an official report. So we're able to extract the data from the system real-time, year-to-date, dated up, up to the date. And that's where you're seeing the current year expenditures are actual expenditures in the fiscal system. Um, the projections we have used Based on those, we will also reevaluate once we have fiscal month three and four um, officially closed, but we're pretty um, confident in, in the accuracy of the data that's in the system and the projections that we're showing. Um, as of December 31st, 2016, you know, the state dentistry fund had expended about 5.9 million. As of December 31st, 2017, um, the state dentistry fund has spent about 6.1 million. So it's trending very, very similar to where they were last year. Um, and in same regards to the, the, to the dental assisting program itself. Um, so we were happy and pleased to, to see that, that occurring. We have been monitoring expenditures, um, and I know there was frustration and lack of reports, but we are working to get there. Um, Department of Consumer Affairs has been deemed a rock star fiscal regardless of some of the reports coming out late. Um, they have used us as kind of a, the training grounds for them because we are such a large and complex department having 38 other boards and bureaus <laughs> that we administer within the system. Um, so there were some unforeseen challenges when we got into the system and actually started transacting in there. Um, they went through a number of, couple of years of user testing and, and really tried to iron out all the bugs before they went live. However, there was just inherent challenges that, that popped up through the processing once we were live in the system and actually transacting within there. Um, again, the, it is a statewide assessment. I know there's some questions with, with regards to the assessment to the funds for the fiscal project. Um, and that is a direct assessment administered by the Department of Finance in conjunction with the fiscal agency, which is a standalone agency as of um, 2016. I have reached out to finance to see about the arbitration process, and they say currently at this time there is not an arbitration process. So it's something if we'd want to pursue, we would have to pull that up the, the, the chain a little bit more. Um, but the system is absolutely working. It, it, it's paying bills. We're, we're paying payroll. Um, and and we're, we're getting there. And, and I'm very happy and pleased with the reports that are going to be coming out of there. It's a very transparent system, much more transparent than CalSTARS and much more detailed oriented as we're seeing. Um, a lot of the reports have much more nuanced detail than CalSTARS provided. And so that's something we're educating ourselves on and we'll be educating your staff as well um, in reading the reports and delivering them to yourselves. Um, any questions on the fiscal system or the, the fund budgets? Are all boards charged a, a fee for using the system? 
they're all the funds are charged by the Department of Finance. The Department of Consumer Affairs does not charge a fee, similar to like it was kind of compared to the breeze. You know, the, it's an assessment charge at the state level, uh, the fund level proportionate to your state appropriation, your state operations. It's not something the Department of Consumer Affairs comes up with. We don't assess each individual board a separate fee. Every fund that is supporting all the other boards and bureaus, they are assessed. Yes. I feel like I should know this, but so will we be getting reports in a different format than the ones that we've been getting up to date? Um, no, you're still going to be getting the same format, but the backup to that, the, the additional detail, the actual accounting uh, official record behind that will be different, but the, the, the reports that you're looking at here, this will stay the same. And in fact, the, the report that, that we're going to be providing to, to the staff is very similar to this that's coming out of the system. It provides month-to-date expenditures, year-to-date expenditures, and percentage benchmarks for all the various line items that comprise your budget. Any further questions of the board? Kevin, thank you for that. Uh, accuracy and uh, transparency, do two good things. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We're like I said. It's it's. It, I'm a I'm a fan of the system. I know there's been lots of hurdles and any kind of infancy in the system. As it matures, we're going to get better in it. The system's going to get better in it. But from a budget perspective and an accounting perspective, the the system is going to have great benefits to to all the boards, bureaus, and to the state in general. Any public comment? Thank you very much. I wanted to thank and compliment Kevin and his team. They've been very helpful uh, to Zach and I over the last few months in trying to straighten out our expenditures and make sure that we were on, in the loop and knowing what was happening. But So thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah, no, thank you, and your staff, is they're, they're phenomenal to work with, and we will be meeting with them m monthly now to be providing the, the more updated reports and looking forward to getting caught up and, and providing them to them. We'll continue a, a great relationship working with them. You talked about anywhere in this report. So um, can you tell us what that fee was? For the assessment for fiscal? Mm -hmm. um, those are the fees that, that Sarah was going over with at the very beginning. Um, I believe it's on page three of the, the memo. Of the budget report? in fiscal year 1617. Those are the, the assessments to the state dentistry fund and I reported out on the state dental assisting fund. And those are all public in the governor's budget. Um, that is a separate line item on your fund condition statement which is a public document so you can see all the historical charges that the fiscal assessments have um, occurred against the fund. Any further questions, comments? Sir, were you going to, is this just the fiscal part, fiscal part of the report? Were you going to go on to the fund condition and expenditures and breeze costs or? I, th I thought I had covered that in the beginning, but I can cover that again. I haven't covered the breeze costs yet, but I went over the budget. Did you want to comment on the uh, number of months in reserve at relating to when our fees went into? Uh, when the new fees went in, are we seeing the recovery begin? those types of things um, at this point on the fund condition the fee the free fee increases went into effect in the Bray system in October and so we began collecting our renewal fees in January um, the application fees were beginning to be incurred in October um, so as a result you'll see that the months in reserve have increased and we're working with budget office to ensure that we are continuing to see that increase moving forward and to make the determination of where, where we need to do that next fee audit and look at our fees in the future just to make sure that we're keeping up to date. So right now we are um, fisc fiscally solvent. If you go to the breeze, attachments in the back, attachment 3A and 3B, you'll see the breeze costs 
for the state dentistry fund and the state dental assisting fund. The costs that we're incurring right now, as I understand, are a result of the maintenance and operations contract. So it's the continuation um, and keeping the Bree system up to date and maintaining it and then um, implementing any new changes that we need to have as well as uh, the credit card processing fees. All right, well, thank you very much for the, that presentation. Much appreciated. Dental assisting. Okay, ready? So agenda item 5A, an update on the dental assisting program. Um, there have been several updates since the last board meeting. We were able to hire a new manager. Ashley Draper started on January 2nd of 2018. She is filling a two-year limited term position for the purpose of building workloads so that we we're hopeful to be able to submit a BCP or a budget change proposal in the future to make that a permanent position. Um, our, we've also hired Maria Collins and she is replacing Leslie Compaz as the second educator education coordinator. She's working side by side by with Laura Fisher. In December, in November and December, Laura had posted a recruitment notice for subject matter experts to participate as um, our course and curriculum evaluators and our site visit evaluators for the dental assisting educational programs and courses. As a result, we had a good um, recruitment and we had approximately a dozen educators come to a training, a two-day training session held in the dental board office in December. And our lead SME, subject matter expert, went through the education process. They went through a mock um, application that had actually already been previously approved. And then those subject matter expert applicants were given homework to essentially go through and do their own evaluation of a course that had pre previously approved that had been deemed deficient. Of course, they didn't know what the deficiencies were, so they had the opportunity to go through and do their review as homework, and those were due back just this last week. And so at this point, we are experiencing a better uh, SME pool. As a result, our education coordinators, Laura and Maria, are embarking on the reevaluation process of the existing approved RDA programs and courses. And so that plan has been put together. We're basing the evaluations on the examination scores for the law and ethics and the general written examinations. Those that have uh, lower passing rates will be evaluated first. And so essentially that will look, um, it will come in the form of a letter. They are anticipating being able to do approximately five reviews per month that ne might not necessarily require a site visit. It will, be, it will depend on the curriculum review, but those programs and courses will effectively submit what our application is with all of the necessary information and it will undergo a review process. So the plan is to have that completely up to date in the next year and a half, pending that this process works um, efficiently. We've also been working on the combining of the RDA written in the law and ethics examination, which I'll be reporting on in just a little bit. We've finalized the review of the RDA EF clinical and practical examination with OPES. Again, I'll be reporting on that in a little bit. And we have an upcoming Dental Assistant Council regulatory workshop scheduled for Mar March 2nd. It's a Friday in Sacramento. It's anticipated that this will be the last regulatory workshop and we'll work, move, be moving forward on preparing the language for the board's consideration to initiate a rulemaking. Um, I also wanted to report that the RDA EF examination schedule for this year has been posted. There have been two examination date changes due to availability of facilities, and so that revised schedule has been posted on the board's website. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a question. How, how long is, um, just to help me in licensing, um, the RDA written in RDA, RDA Law and Ethics, those exams, are they hours, day long, 
I mean, I, I, I see it written on my, in my syllabus, and, and sometimes I don't know what it entails and what, what it encompasses. Um, and I'll, I'll have to get back to you on the exact time frame of each examination. Um, however, they, they can be administered during one day. It's administered through PSI, which is a computer-based testing agency. And candidates have the ability to call and schedule their testing appointment with PSI and then um, call and reschedule if they had a failure. So it can be accomplished through one day of testing. They can schedule both tests on the same day. Um, most of the time, though, they've been scheduling them on different days. Are there review courses for that? There may be, there's not a board approved review course for that. Okay, thank you. Dr. Witcher. Yeah, having been involved on the Dental Assisting Council, I'd just like to thank Sarah for all the work that went into this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, RDA program uh, application is a very lengthy document, and to go through the curriculum and review that is not a small undertaking. So uh, I think many of our programs have never had a review, and so this is long overdue. And, uh, but it's, it's, the reason it's taken us a while to get around to doing this is it's not a small project. So I'd like to thank you for doing that and recruiting all the SMEs and getting the manpower necessary to do this up and trained. I mean, that's, a, that's really a it's, a, it's real progress that I haven't seen in a while. So it's really good to see. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Witcher. Public comment? Seeing none, sir. Continuing on to agenda item 5B, update on dental assisting programs and courses. Board staff has provided basically, it's a year in closeout of 2017 and the applications that have been reviewed and approved. During 2017, there were 39 program and course applications that were approved by the dental board. Uh, we conducted four site visits as reported on page one. If you turn to page two, it provides an application status going into 2018. So again, we had approved 39 applications. We have 15 in review process and four are pending site visits. At the end of page two, you'll see the total number of approved dental assisting programs and courses. And on pages three through five, it provides a breakdown of what courses the specific provider names that were approved in 2017. I just want to compliment you on that. That has been a problem, a huge problem in the past. So this is finally looking good. We're, we're very lucky to have the staff that we have. Uh, Laura Fisher has really brought it up to the level it needs to be at, and she's bringing Maria along. Maria's only been with us for two weeks, and she's already played an integral part in getting this launched and, and rocking and rolling into 2018. So I think this is gonna be a good year for us. Agenda item 5C, update on dental assisting examination statistics. These are the statistics that we've been able to pull out of our Breeze examination system. Um, these are relative to the written examination results for the RDA, law and ethics, and the general written examination, and of course the RDA EF and the OA and the DSA written examinations. We also have the information relating to the RDA EF clinical and practical examination statistics, as well as a breakdown of the individual schools and their statistics and provided in the packet. If, if you look at the statistics for the written examination, this is the data that staff based the reevaluation of the programs on. And so they went through and sorted the scores according to uh, pass and failure rates for the RDA written and the RDA law and ethics, and that's how they've made the priority listing of who would be evaluated first.
board questions for Sarah on this one? Public comment? Hi, I'm Dr. Guy Atchison, representing the California Academy of General Dentistry. I, I was really pleased to see the individual statistics for RDA programs being published, especially the pass-fail rate. And so I wondered, uh, you know, what the threshold was for concern about individual programs, and then uh, what kind of uh, action or activities are the result of programs that seem to fall below whatever your threshold is for what would be an acceptable program or a program of concern? Th those are all questions that we've been asking ourselves. Th that is actually um, an issue where we don't have a threshold right now and we don't have really the authority to withdraw approval so that's something that we're looking at in our regulations and I intend to bring that up during a sunset review as an issue as well as working with the Board of uh, Private Post-Secondary Education and the Department of Education on so we're working on forming those partnerships to further develop what our authority and what our enforcement action is to ensure that these students are being provided a quality education. And then a follow-up would be, are these statistics available to the public, and especially uh, RDA students are consumers, and a lot of us as dentists sometimes provide a benefit to our unlicensed staff to get their education and their license, and we'd like to know that our staff are, have an opportunity to have a good program result. Um, are those statistics available? We do post those statistics on the board website, and I'll double check when I get back to the office to make sure that those are clearly conveyed on the board's website. Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, I think, Dr. Ashton, if I might comment, uh, Sarah mentioned that we are doing program reviews, starting with the lowest scoring programs first. So there is a plan although there may not be a threshold, we do have a rationale. And, and, and those statistics are available. You, they're a little hard to find, but if you use the search function, you can find them. Abigail. I'm hoping that there's a way that it's, um, you don't have to necessarily go through all those steps, so when a student or someone that visits the website, they can actually view it without having to look for it and makes it easier for them in case there's a student that wants to get more information. When I get back to the office, I'll make sure it's more clearly conveyed on the website. Yeah, it gets back to accuracy and transparency. And, and um, so I guess that, that's, a, that's a, something that we need to look at regarding this. I think that's important information for, for the consumers. If I might comment, I think we've been making these statistics available in the board meeting packet for a number of years, I think at least five years. So it's not really anything new. Um, it's one of my favorite things to follow is the comparison between CODA programs, uh, 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 on the job trained, and the other programs. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lori Gallardi representing KDAP, California Association for Dental Assisting Teachers. So um, while I appreciate the discussion about the statistics and everything else, I think you also have to look at how those st statistics are actually listed. Um, you may have 15 candidates that took the exam maybe seven of them failed, so you have a 50% pass rate. But then the next time, those same seven may take the exam the next time, and they all pass, so now you have a 100% pass rate. So individually, you may have one set of percentages, but then that aggregates into the total percentage. So while you may say, well, what's wrong with these programs, I think you also have to look at the exam plan that these individuals have to look at to study for the exam. 
Um, and so that's not always real complete or hard to identify as well. So I would encourage you to put all that information together because you really don't know when you look at the individual stats with the passing rate, how many of those are re-exam in a certain program versus how many are first time exam. You also have to go back and look at that exam plan and try to figure out exactly what are the questions that are on there and how do they relate. And so the current exam plan, I know we've been in discussion with, it lists some small percentages that are you know, listed in each content area. And then you have the law and ethics that's interwoven with all the other subject matter extra um, information. So when you look at the ethics, the ethics part is not in the DPA. That's coming from another source. So um, I just, I think it's interesting that perhaps you also need to go back and really look at that exam plan and the outline and how that's worded to the individuals that are now taking the exam. So thank you. Yeah, looking at those numbers, I'd agree with you. I see that we have a lot of small numbers, which are really hard to know what they mean when you have a 50% pass rate, one took it, one failed, doesn't tell you a lot. Dr. Lay. Yeah. Well, just like everything else, I think when we look at these numbers, I appreciate these, the data, by the way. Um, I think we need to look at the trend and not just the data that's being presented today. This is just a snapshot. And I think, you know, for, for the public or anyone else who's looking for programs or trying to evaluate programs, you really need to go back to the statistics in, in the past and look at the trend. Uh, speaking to the, the first time versus the repeat test takers, that is data that we're trying to extract from the Breeze system currently. We've had a couple goes at it, and uh, we have several questions, and so I'm hopeful that we'll be able to provide that at a future board meeting, um, but we, we are at the mercy of the Breeze systems, too. You have reported that information for the, for the cumulative total, though. We, we have prior to Breeze. Uh, we are on an update on dental assisting licensure statistics, agenda item 5D. Board staff has provided the standard agenda item. Um, I wanted to point out when I reviewed this, th the numbers seem off from the last board meeting. And again, we're looking into why that's happening. Again, that's a result of pulling this information from a statistical program that were provided through Breeze. And so what we are in the process of doing right now is setting up manual controls, if, if per se, um, to track statistics in the office against what Breeze is reporting to see what is accurate. So there just seems to be a lot of fluctuation and the overall total population seems to be differentiating significantly from board meeting to board meeting. So I wanted to point that out. I don't have an explanation at this point in time, but we are working on that. Uh, we also provided, as requested at the last board meeting, the active licensees by county as of January of 2018. We broke out the number of RDAs and the number of DDSs and then provided a ratio of RDAs to DDSs in that table as well. Board questions, comments? Uh, yeah, the, oh, uh, the dentist to assistant ratio is really very interesting. Dr. Lai would appreciate that San Francisco County has the worst. <laughs> very hard to find, a, <laughs> very, very hard to find assistance in, in some of those metropolitan areas. Page four of the memorandum through page five provides information on our application processing and the number of applications that we've been processing the number of approved, the number of licenses that have been issued, and those that have been canceled or withdrawn from the application process. Seeing no uh, questions from the board, uh, public comment?
Moving on to agenda item 5E, the update regarding the combining of the RDA law and ethics and general written examination. Um, we've been reporting on this at several board meetings. We're still in the process of working with the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Professional Examination Services. They are doing the legwork on providing the com combination. Essentially, as a result of the RDA occupational analysis, it was determined that we needed to update these written examinations, and the best way to do going about doing that was to combine those two examinations. Uh, OPES has been holding workshops with subject matter experts that have been recruited from the licensing pools, and they have pr um, conducted exam construction workshops. They originally, we originally posted an examination plan for the new combined exam in November of 2017. We received comments from stakeholders where I reviewed with OPES and we made a revision to that exam plan. That revised exam plan is now posted on the board's website. It's my understanding from other discussions today that some other stakeholders may have some concerns. And so if anybody does have concerns relating to that exam plan, please email me what your concerns are and I'll be happy to work with OPES on um, going over that and seeing what, need, what needs to be changed, if anything. And so right now the plan has been to launch this new exam in May of 2018. Of course, with that, we have to take into consideration the Breeze implementation. And so we have been working <laughs> side by side with the Breeze team um, and going to meetings to put in the, the authorizations to have this work completed and converted over. <laughs> Essentially the way PSI <coughs> works, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry. Um, there's an interface between PSI and our Breeze system where the results of the examinations are transmitted directly over to Breeze and uploaded into the system. And so in order to do this, we have to make some modifications to the Breeze system to essentially cancel out the law and ethics and the general examinations and com create a combined examination rule in Breeze to accept these new results. <clears throat> and so in doing this, there may be a time period of time where PSI does not administer the law and ethics and written examinations. Um, this is in order to ensure that candidates who have taken the test, that their results have transmitted successfully over to the dental board, uploaded into our current BREA system, and that the eligibilities that have been outstanding to take the law and ethics and the written examinations that haven't been taken yet are pulled offline from PSI, and everybody that still has to take those examinations are issued new eligibility to PSI to take the combined examination. And so once we get those dates, right now I'm waiting for, for Breeze to essentially give us what that conversion date is going to be, we will be posting on our board's website the notification, and we'll be notifying all the educators of these changes so that they can anticipate that in, with their students. I have a question. We always hear from our side of the, the table, are the dental assisting schools happy about this change and have they put in a lot of input in how we can make it better for them? So educators are not, um, with, with OPES, they run, they tell us what recruitment requirements there are. And so there's a certain conflict of interest that we have to be careful of where educators can't necessarily be, um, they can be involved in certain parts of the process in developing the examination, but what they're trying to base the examination on is what is the current practice of those licensed out in the field. And so the educators have been contacting me relating to the examination plan and the additional information that they need and what additional uh, concerns they have regarding that. At that point, I work as an intermediary Board staff does not get involved in what changes need to be made. We work with, through OPES, who is the expert on that, to make whatever modifications we need to make. I know that one question has been the candidate exam guide and when that it will be posted, and PSI and OPES are working on making those modifications, and that will be posted as soon as it becomes available. But again, we're, we're waiting at this point to see when Breeze can implement this, so I'm hopeful for May. Um, but if not, then it would probably be July. Okay. 
Lori Gillardi representing KDAT again. And in answer to your question, yes, Sarah, you know, has been working with the educators. However, we have a full plate in our curriculum. So keep in mind, we're trying to prepare students to take the May exam, and we don't have any guidelines. We don't know what resources were used to develop the questions or anything else. And although as educators we keep current with technology, as Sarah mentioned, the previous exam had outdated information in it. And so a lot of the exam questions, I believe, are more critical thinking. Well, if you've learned one technique <laughs> based on current knowledge and technology, and then the exam <laughs> is based on maybe something that might be tweaked a little bit different, you know, that comes that judgment call that judgment call comes with experience. So I can tell you as educators, we're, we're really every day saying, where's that PSA candidate's handbook? Because we have very few months to get our students, even though we think that they've been prepared all along, but really to put them into that test mode. So thank you for the question. I, I um, saw you in the background, so I, I saw you conversing with somebody. And I wanted to just reiterate, the board's here to help. We're not the bad guys here so we want to work with you and we want to, we want to make you know our side happy and your side happy but the only way we get um, to that point we have to all understand each other that we're trying as best we can and so that's why these questions come up at, at these meetings well, and I think we really um, appreciate that as well, but like when you launch any new exam, it's nice if you can have the whole exam plan and maybe the year to prepare all to your curriculum and, and do whatever, because you figure our students have really been learning technology, critical thinking since they started in the fall in preparation for the end results. So. I'm sure you have enough experience to put that in gear really quickly. Thank you. Sarah, I have a question r regarding the launch, the launch date. Do we have flexibility in that? Um, we have to work with OPES. Um, as far as Breeze goes, the, the flexibility is contingent upon the release dates that they have available. And so the next release date is May. The next release date available after that would be July. It's my understanding they, they have, um, these releases are every two months, so. It also, just to clarify, OPES is still working on the item construction and putting the data bank together, the, the test item bank together, so there are still workshops occurring. I'm sorry, just follow up. Uh, Dr. Gallardi, so what I heard from you is that you would almost prepare, you would almost rather see the launch delayed until educators received a copy of the candidate handbook and the exam plan. Is that what I heard? Well. Yes, I mean, I think that we could check with other educators too, but one thing as an educator, we try to teach the students to read the exam plan, to understand, you know, these are the references they use to come up with the questions, these are the type of questions that could be asked, and we don't have any resources to go by at this point in time other than what was previously, you know, used. Claudia Pohl, um, California Dental Assistance Association. Um, I would concur with Lori that I think we would prefer to see it pushed back and have the educators have what they need to really um, have the resources and the materials. Is there a way that we can communicate with uh, OPES and uh, OPES and, and share these concerns and, and, um, and, and, and have them uh, helping us come up with a interim solution? Yes. I mean, I just want to say how difficult it is to, um, and Sarah's done a wonderful job trying to stay on top of launches in Breeze. And, and this, um, this poses a, a more difficult challenge in that working with PSI and getting everything coordinated is is very, very difficult. Um, so 
I want to express that publicly, that of course we appreciate all the work that's gone to this point, and we're close, um, but we, we will need to sort of, hearing what we're hearing today, we'll do the best we can, but Sarah's gonna be working with our experts in OPES to determine what they believe, um, how, I, just because this question came up as a re, is it related to Breeze, and so I just wanted to point out that we we do have an obligation. Um, the board has an obligation to provide the most legally defensible examination, and um, we would just need to be prepared to justify why we would have that delay. Um, because essentially what the RDA occupational analysis has pointed out is that the exam does need to be updated. And so we're going through that process to update it. So um, we'll just have to, we'll work with OPS and see what can be done. I'm Cindy Ovard from um, San Joaquin Valley College, Temecula. And just to reiterate, as an educator, um, it, it is important for that blueprint. I appreciate the blueprint that's out there now. It, it is more detailed than the other one from the past previous test. But commonly, when we get a blueprint, it states the textbooks that, that are listed, where they received the questions, where, what you know, questions were taken from. And some of the questions on the blueprint right now deal with obsolete um, equipment. They're talking about film-based for radiology, how to use the film base. And we're not film-based anymore. We're pretty much digital. And so I even had a student the other day ask me, are there gonna be questions on, on material and equipment that we don't use that is obsolete now? Um, some offices still use the film, but the majority, I mean, the majority of the schools are teaching digital. So that's where we have to go and stay with the, the current trend. But we need to be able to have the textbooks that, that these questions came from. We need to have a guide of, of where, because there's, there's a myriad of textbooks that are out there, and many of the, the educational schools use pretty much the same ones, but there's still so many that come from it. And coming from um, the aspect of, of being involved with the national testing, I, I do know that we, we need to have that on our blueprint. The blueprint is great now, but it needs to be better before we can actually implement a new exam. Can I respond to that? Respond to that to her? Can I respond to you? So I, um, I think, well, in my understanding of dentistry for many years, there's nothing that really goes obsolete and the person providing the service and the person helping the person provide the service need to have a full um, gamut of, of, of what they need to know. And, and right now I would say of the updated offices, I would say it's less than 20%, 30%. And a lot of people still use digital and a lot of people still use regular film. They have to know how to develop. So um, I think rather than, than to, to close our eyes, we have to open them wider because there's so much differences and, and variations in dentistry. And I agree with that. I'm just also, um, you know, we're Southern California coming from Loma Linda who just recently redid their whole radiology lab and completely, you know, got away with film. So they're all digital, and that's where most of our dentists are coming from. And so we're trying to teach our students, you know, that technology. So testing on it and knowledge that they don't, we still do teach it, but not the way that we would the digital, and I understand that. I, and that's uh, just one question. Um, most of the exam is textbook knowledge, so it's gonna be a little bit different when they go into practice, and we understand that, and we do teach them that it will be different. We're getting them book smart. So we need to know what books we're, we're, we need for that blueprint. Thank you. We've heard your comments, and we will take that into consideration. Thank you very much. Dr. Morrow. Real quick, as an educator myself, I uh, hear what you're saying, and I agree with 
most of it and disagree with some of it, so I won't go into that at this point. But uh, in relationship and response to the teaching of digital imaging uh, at the university that you mentioned, uh, that university still teaches uh, uh, analog film radiography. Uh, however, uh, it's important that dental assistants also have knowledge base that deals with uh, systems that might not be the most popular as far as trending, but yet are still utilized by some dentists. So to the degree at which that, is, that subject matter is taught, I think should also reflect it in the degree in which questions are asked on an examination regarding that uh, method of, of radiography. Uh, we can move on. So agenda item 5F, the report on the results of the DCA Office of Professional Examination Services review of the RDAEF clinical and practical examination. After, I'm sorry. RDAEF occupational analysis was completed by the DCA Office of Professional Examination Services. We embarked on a review of the RDAEF clinical and practical examination, similar to as what we did with the RDA practical examination. So OPES staff came to two of our examination administrations in 2017, one conducted at UCLA and one conducted at UCSF. The purpose of their observations was to evaluate the process of the clinical and practical examinations with regard to reliability of the measurement, the examiner training and test scoring, the administration and test security, and the fairness to determine if the examinations meet the professional guidelines and technical standards. OPES did conclude that the examinations do meet the professional guidelines and technical standards with regard to reliability of measurement, examiner training and scoring, test administration, test security and fairness. OPS did make a recommendation that we make some enhancements to the examiner calibration. Not that there was anything wrong with the examiner calibration, but merely add some additional slides to enhance the current training, and as well as make some additional uh, tweaks to the test administration, such as providing additional signage clocks, providing additional reminders about prohibitive items during the check-in and uh, checking the room temperature. And so board staff is working with OPES to implement those changes to the RDAEF exam moving forward. Question of the board, comments? Public comment? So ag agenda item 5G, update on the Dental Assistant Council re member recruitment. Um, we have posted a recruitment notice on our board's website. Um, I'm going to be sharing that recruitment notice with a couple of the stakeholders who've uh, stated that they're willing to share that on their social media accounts as well. Essentially, we are in the process of recruiting for two dental assisting educator positions and one clinical position for the Dental Assisting Council. Right now, uh, board out the applications for the council are due by next Friday, February 16th. Depending on how many applications we receive, we may push that back a week or two just to ensure that we have adequate time to receive those applications. And I believe a, a Dr. Stewart has appointed a subcommittee to review those applications. At this point, we expect those applications to be considered by the board at the May board meeting and um, have those appointments made at that time. All right, board comments, questions, public comment? Seeing none, thank you, Sarah. I think before we get into uh, item six, I, I think uh, I'd like to call about a 10 minute recess. Is that all right? Item six and seven. At the end of seven, we're, we will take a break. And at that point, uh, the public session will be in recess until nine o'clock in the morning. The board will, uh, will, will go find a sandwich somewhere. We'll go to lunch and, uh, and then we'll uh, 
hopefully be back here reconvened for our closed session by no later, possibly even earlier than 3 p.m. So for the board, to, for your understanding. Um, so let's let's move on, and I see we're ready to go into item six. Allison Veramontes, legislative and regulatory analyst for the board. Um, in regards to agenda item 6A, the 2018 tentative legislative calendar, I have attached the Senate and Assembly calendars um, for your review. Any concerns, questions of the board? Okay, thank you. Agenda item 6B, discussion and possible action on legislation. Board staff is currently tracking six bills. Uh, I did wanna provide an update to uh, Assembly Bill 12, the state government administrative regulations review bill. Um, this bill died pursuant to joint rule 56 as of February 1st, 2018 and was re returned to the assembly chief clerk's office. I have no other updates um, for the remaining bills. I believe they are the same as this last status in November. Board questions, comments? Okay, Allison, Allison, what are you gonna do? Excuse me, sorry. There has been no update, but I can I can read their name if there's any public comment about that, if that would be preferred. I think that would be good. Okay, great. So Assembly Bill 224, um, Dentistry, Anesthesia, and Sedation. I believe the board took a watch position on this um, in February 2017. Um, do you, want to, do you want me to just read the rest of the bills at all or just take public comment on any of the bills that we have? Okay, if there's any public comment on the rest of the bills. Okay, is there any public comment of for any of the bills that are on the agenda? Uh, Jenna Scarborough, Center for Public Interest Law. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the status of um, AB 224, uh, SB 501, and I think it's, I'm not sure if it's um, 394, I believe is the other one. 392. Mm -hmm. um, I see, so as of the, the status that's on, um, each of these, is this as of the last me uh, meeting from the, so analysis uh, AB 224 has been withdrawn, is that as of the last meeting or is that a new update? That's the same as, it, as it's been since before. There's been no amendments um, to the bills since we last provided the analysis. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, who who are you representing again? The Center for Public Interest Law. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to provide an update on the 2018 Healing Arts Omnibus Bill proposal. Um, the board's 2018 Healing Arts Omnibus Bill pr proposal was submitted, um, agenda item six. Yes, 
six B Roman numeral six. Sorry about that. Um, the board submitted the 2018 Healing Arts Omnibus Bill proposal um, to the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee um, on January 4th, 2018. And I've um, attached the language that was submitted um, for your review. The board language was approved at the last uh, November board meeting um, and two portions were approved in concept and um, the board's legal counsel did approve that as well. The board's familiar the purpose of the omnibus bill. Do we need to review that at all for anybody or, or are we good? We've talked about it, I know, in the past. I think we're good. We're good. Agenda item 6C, uh, discussion and possible action regarding additional amendments to the board's proposal for the 2018 Healing Arts Omnibus Bill has been withdrawn. And I'll just give a little explanation to that. Um, after the last meeting, we were approached by CDA with some issues that they wanted to know whether or not the board would consider putting them in the omnibus bill. The omnibus bill, as you know, is uh, an opportunity for the board to put changes into statute that would be considered not substantive and would not be controversial. So as we were putting this packet together, we were hopeful that we may be able to uh, take the items that CDA was interested in uh, having the board review, but we actually ran out of time in order to prepare it in such a way that it wouldn't be perceived as, uh, we weren't sure that we could present it in a way that it would be considered non-substantive and non-controversial. So I contacted CDA and let them know that those, there would be another opportunity for them to bring those issues before the board and that those issues could be perhaps resolved or taken care of during their sunset review period. So it's likely that you could see these issues come perhaps at the May meeting when we start discussing future issues to take up during the sunset review period. Public comment on, on that? Seeing none. Agenda item 60, uh, the discussion of pr prospective legislative proposals. Stakeholders are encouraged to submit proposals in writing to the board before or during the meeting for possible consideration by the board at a future meeting. Continue. Agenda item 6E, the update on pending regulatory packages uh, regarding continuing education requirements and basic life support equivalency standards. Uh, board staff has drafted the initial rulemaking file documents and staff is currently working on the re recommendation and edits from the board's legal counsel. Uh, board staff plans to submit the rulemaking file documents to DCA and agency for the initial phase once reviewed by the board's legal counsel subsequently. During the recess, Jerry passed out this little regular rulemaking process. It shows the initial and final phase for a regulation, um, rule, regular rulemaking process if you did want to know uh, what the initial and final phase includes. Uh, regarding the dental assisting comprehensive rulemaking, board staff is continue to work on, continuing to work on the development of final proposed langu language and will present it to the board for consideration at a future meeting and the next workshop is scheduled for March 2nd, 2018 in Sacramento. Regarding the determination of radiographs and placements of interim therapeutic restorations, the initial rulemaking documents are currently being prepared by board staff. Uh, elective facial cosmetic surgery permit application requirements and renewal. Board staff has drafted the initial rulemaking file documents and staff is currently working on the recommendation edits from the board's legal counsel. Um, board staff plans to submit the rulemaking file documents to DCA and agency for the initial phase once reviewed by the board's legal counsel. 
uh, regarding institutional standards. Again, we've drafted the initial rulemaking file documents and we're working on the edits and we plan to submit the rulemaking file documents to DCA and agency for the initial phase once reviewed by the board's legal counsel again. Licensure by credential application requirements. Uh, we're currently working on the rulemaking file documents to bring to the board for consideration at a future meeting. Mobile, de mo mobile and portable dental clinic units. Uh, board staff revised the approved language after meeting um, with DC or with CDA, excuse me. Um, and board staff has re revised the proposed language, which we'll be presenting to the board for consideration um, at a different agenda item uh, for possible acceptance um, at this meeting to continue the rulemaking process. Uh, regarding citation and fine, uh, the initial rulemaking documents are currently being prepared. Minimum standards for infection control. Um, board staff plans to present the revised language to the board uh, for possible consideration and acceptance at the February or at this meeting uh, to continue in a rulemaking, uh, an emergency rulemaking, but we'll discuss that at a different agenda item. Uh, questions, comments from the board? Seeing none, public comment. Uh, Guy Atchison, California Academy of General Dentistry. Um, the um, just a question on the determination of radiographs and placement of interim therapeutic restorations. This is what part of the pilot program, the OSHPOD program with teledentistry and RDA. RDHAPs. Um, I guess I'd kind of like to know what the status of that is. Is that I hear OSHPOD programs never die. So is, are we looking at creating this? I mean, the program keeps going even though the evaluation period is completed. Um, where are we on that as far as a license category? Will this be a separate license category, RDHAP with teledentistry? Or? We're going to ask Sarah Wallace to come forward and she can explain um, basically what, what will be happening is when we get our regulations in place, we will have a permit that EFs will be able to apply for, but she'll go ahead and explain the process. So the, the status of the health, health workforce pilot project is it's complete. And then as a result, there was AB 1174, I think it was three years ago now, that implemented the findings in statute. And if, uh, as it relates to the dental board itself, um, there were uh, enhancements to the RDA EF category for EFs to be able to make determination of radiographs and the placement of ITRs. Um, we have approved, I believe there are two programs that are currently approved to offer that curriculum. And we have not had any applicants yet, but we have um, implemented essentially what will happen is it's not an additional permit category as much as it is um, an additional uh, qualification on their license to, to show that they have that scope of practice. So it is in effect, it is implemented, and so the regs have been developed to drill down and, and make more specific the requirements for that curriculum review. Uh, thank you for that. I thought it was RDHAPs that were part of that, but it's EFs, RDHAPs? It does impact RDHAPs, and tone, I think Anthony Lum from Dental Hygiene will speak to that, but Hygiene Committee has to promulgate their own regulations, and the Dental Board promulgates our regulations. Um, ours are rel relative to the RDAEFs, while Hygiene Committee has the authority over the hygienist categories. Thank you. And... Anthony Lum, a Dental Hygiene Committee Executive Officer. Just to comment on that, um, it's correct that we are also promulgating regulations for the ITR uh, purpose uh, from 1174, and we got a little delay because of sunset, and so we'll be working on that as soon as possible to get those in place. It's uh, actually for uh, not only the HAP category, but also for our registered dental hygienists um, inclusive who are learning the process in their educational programs. Thank you. Dr. Witcher. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, in terms of how the regulations were developed, uh, if, you know, Sarah can fill you in better on this than I, but 
they parallel what was in the pilot project very closely. So they're, they're really nothing new. Uh, they're what already, already kind of went through as part of 1174, uh, if that helps. It, it, was, it was a pretty proscribed package, I believe. Correct. Uh, we, we use the Health Workforce Pilot Project curriculum, um, everything that Dr. Paul Glassman had put together and essentially put it in a regulatory format uh, with an application package for the educators to be able to provide to us with all the information. So just try to make it in a friendly, friendly or user-friendly format for our applicants. I just wanted to, to clarify, you said that this would not be a certificate but it just would be additional endorsements, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so when a RDAEF uh, essentially becomes um, certified, I guess, to, to perform these, then there would be an additional modification to their, their pocket license. So similar to the RDAs where it has coronal polish or Pitt and Fisher or, or X-ray on the bottom. Um, Lori Glardy, just representing myself. Um, just a clarification question. So if I believe you have two providers for the ITRs currently, and can they only offer that course to the RDAEFs, or can they offer it to the RDAEFs as well as RDHs? And if you're an RDH, do you have to take it through a provider through DHCC? <laughs> or how does That's that work? That's a good question. Uh, let me go but get back to you on that but as far as right now it, it, the board's authority is over RDAEFs so um, what I've shared with other those program providers is that if they needed to to get that approval then they were going to need to talk to hygiene committee to see what process they were going to need to go through but um, Thank you. Uh, Anthony Lum dental hygiene committee again uh, just to add on to that, that's what the regulations that we're going to be promulgating will address. Currently, uh, for RDHs, it's just the students that are in the programs that are learning. Uh, we're going to promulgate regulations for existing RDHs to be able to obtain the training for the uh, ITR. Just to clarify, the two programs that are approved are RDAEF programs, and so I believe their intention was to just add th this curriculum on to what they have existing for their EFs. It, it wasn't all that long ago that several of us in this room were uh, site evaluators for that project and uh, spent uh, months, I, I believe even a couple of years, in going out and looking in the community and watching, watching that process. And uh, it was absolutely incredible from my perspective watching the RDHAPs and the folks out in very remote sites in difficult situations with patients that would not have been would would have been very difficult to see otherwise being taken care of and helped by by this process. So uh, it was. Uh, it's just nice to see that it, you know that we can identify an area to help additional citizens in California and get some get some dentistry to these folks uh, that are that are most in need. So my comment. Agenda item 6F, discussion and possible action regarding decreasing the licensure by residency fee. Um, Assembly Bill 179 increased the maximum fee amounts um, that the board may assess, and as a result, the board raised licensing and permitting, permit fees um, that became effective um, immediately and implemented um, in Breeze on October 19, 2017. Uh, during the November meeting, um, Public comment was received from various stakeholders concerning the fee increases, and stakeholders were co commented on the licensure by residency fee increase. Um, I've provided within this memo um, the application fees for the various pathways to dental licensure in California, um, including the um, licensure by residency fee uh, pathway um, in the table. And on the back page, I um, provided the number of dental licenses issued in 2017 via uh, the fourth pathways um, in, the, in that table. 
essentially what we're asking the board to do today is to discuss whether or not it would consider um, decreasing that licensure by residency fee. I'm sure you all recall when we were going through the fee increase that we we conducted the fee audit. We had the, the presentation of the findings of the fee audit based on the workload involved with the fees. We had a subcommittee involved with the with reviewing all of those fees and making recommendations to the full board as to where that fee needed to be. And so we went through the rulemaking process or the regulatory process to implement all of those fees. So that is all said and done. So the fees that we have right now are in existence. That's what was launched in Breeze in, in uh, October. Um, to, to make a modification to the fee at this point would require another rulemaking, which we can do. But board staff would need to get more guidance from the board as to where you would like to see the fee. We would need to work with our budget office to conduct um, an analysis of our fund condition to ensure that it wouldn't have a significant impact on the, the fiscal solvency that we have right now. Um, and then we would be able to support that moving forward with a potential rulemaking where we could bring uh, proposed language for the board to consider at the, a future meeting. So. I mean, for a starting point, if you wanted to say uh, the LBR fee should be equitable to the LBC fee, so 525, then we would go back to budget office and see if the 525 could be sustained within the fund condition. So just for an example. Dr. Witcher? Yeah, I was on the subcommittee that looked at the original fees, and we did recommend a fee for LBR that was more in line. Uh, so it was just that got changed. Yeah, so looking at the changes in the fees, you can see that both licensure by rep and by residency used to be $100. And then we moved it up to 400 for the rep and 800 for residency program. It was quite a big change. And I think we had some discussions about that. If the process of reviewing the application is exactly the same or close, similar, then why would the fees be so different. Um, I should give you an example. I'm actually in the process of hiring one of my former resident who did AHED residency with me years ago. Um, actually not years ago, like three, four years ago. She got married, moved to Texas. She had to take the RAP exam. Now she's moved back to California. She wants to get her license in California, which she did not apply after immediately following the residency program as she should have. Um, so anyway, so now uh, she's in the process of obtaining California license. When I asked her which process, uh, which pathway she was looking into, she told me she was applying, you know, um, using RAB and not residency program because of the fee difference. One is $400 and one is $800. I know it's just one example, but it is something to consider. So um, I know Bruce, you did a lot of work on this. Was that was this part of the original? I don't remember this being that it was pretty across the board about the same. So I don't know how that doubled. I remember, you know, we were all in agreement that the budget was correct and to to raise it. But why did that? I, I think I think uh, portfolio was high, and then we lowered it, and then. It was the same as uh, as the credential, uh, license by credential. So Do you remember that? If I, I can address part of that. So if you if you were looking at that fee audit, several of the fees that were recommended by the auditor were significantly higher than what the board actually implemented. And so there were adjustments made by the board where, with considerations taken into account uh, for portfolio and um, an applicant's ability to pay based on what pathway they were. But the thing is with our fee increase, we still had to reach a certain bottom line. And so adjustments were made to certain fees while portfolio, yes, was lowered. Other fees were going to have to be increased to absorb that that decrease over there. So I think that that is part of where we got to the licensure by residency fee, fee where it is. It is, the workload was taken into account during the fee audit, but when it got to the board and we have to take into account what fees are, um, we also had to take into account what the bottom line was going to be 
and we had a certain goal and threshold we needed to meet on our fund condition. Otherwise, we were going to go into insolvency. So that's where those adjustments came from. Why well, I understand all that. I just feel like, you know, the, the differences in the fees need to be revisited because um, it just, I mean, like, you know, of course, I don't know the staff time that's involved in each, for each process. It's just that, you know, when, for the initial license fee to be so different, you know, using different path, pathways, um, I'm just worried that it's, it's really discouraging people, you know, to go through to residency program or just like, you know, now, like for this particular person, I mean, now she has a choice, you know, and then she would go for the lower fee pathway. Um, I mean, even with that, that that would be up to her anyway. It's out right. there. I mean, it would be up to her to decide which pathway, whether how to get her her license. So, I think if she is astute enough, she would always pick the, the lesser of the two, right? Well, yeah, no, I understand that. But I'm just saying, I mean, you know, to go from the same fee to one to four hundred and then to eight hundred for the basically the same process, the same procedure, and probably. I mean, I don't know about the workload, you know, which one would take longer. It just seems to me like licensure by credential probably would take a lot longer because you have to contact other states, you know, and validate the license and all that. But it's only 525. I, um, I think you know, that anyway. we'd have to understand more what the REV workload is for that. Um, so that's my comment on that. But in general, my comment would be that we spent an awful lot of time on this, and um, I don't know that, I mean, certainly there's always um, times that you want to revisit things, but I don't know that we want to do that at this time. We're seemingly taking things out of context. One context of one big um, jump doesn't tell us what the cost analysis of each one of them were. And we should use it in the, maybe the context of looking at all. So unless we see what the subcommittee did for the um, cost analysis of each of these categories, it's not a, a, not a wise business decision or let alone a fairness issue. I believe that information was provided perhaps before you came on the board, Dr. Chan. Now, I'm in agreement with respect to uh, the time that was put into this. I guess what I'm trying to understand is that the subcommittee worked really hard on, on, on this particular issue. Did the cost, did the cost change between what the subcommittee recommended and then when we did the budgeting process? I, it would have been, the subcommittee discussed it, the board would have made modifications that we took back to the budget office to make modifications to, and then we presented the recommended fee that could get us to where we needed to be to make the modifications to the, the fees that the board wanted. And so the final product that the board adopted were the, these fees. Okay, and then we adopted it. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the amount of staff time about the, the amount of time going back into this, the amount of staff time, and that equates into dollars and cents as well. And again, um, the individual still has a choice in whether or not they want to, to select these four options. And so I don't know how much good it would, it would do us to go back and revisit this again because if we do, it's still going to throw off the budget. We'll have to take it from somewhere else. Then we're going to go down, I feel, maybe, just maybe a rabbit hole 
because we'd have to adjust somewhere else in our budget. Am I correct? There, there's always potential that we would have to adjust. Um, as I mentioned during the budget report, um, the fund condition projections for months in reserve right now are less than what we had projected at the end of October. And with that in mind, we've met with the budget office. We're going to have a follow-up meeting to discuss why that's occurring. For obvious reasons, there's um, increased expenditures um, for personnel-related costs, and that, happen that occurs every year. Um, but taking that into consideration, that's probably going to up the schedule for us to conduct our next fee audit, where we thought it would probably wouldn't be until two sunset reviews. It may be sooner than that. Ms. Medina. Uh, I would have to agree in, in the sense of looking at um, reducing the fees. Honestly, when you look at the, the jump, it, it just doesn't make any sense. I know that when you're looking at how much is, time is being put into it. But in reality, if it doesn't look right, it just doesn't look fair. I mean, I think it's, it's proper that we look into it more because the, there's just, it, it's just a huge jump. Do we need a consensus to move forward with this to see if we can look at reducing the fees? So then how do we find out at the end so we can move forward if that's the case? We're not through with the discussion yet, but uh, we could get to a motion. And As I recall, when we were discussing the fee audit and proposed fee increases, we, we had discussion about the fact that we weren't sure how this would project out and we were going to see how it went. And if we were ahead of projections, we might actually reduce some fees. And so I would say it's just a little bit premature to be making adjustments. And if we're going to make them, maybe they would need to be more across the board and it could be taken up then. Now I'm hearing our projections are below where we hoped they would be you know, which raises a larger question of do we need to raise, you know, do a fee audit earlier. But I, I think um, rather than piecemeal this, we may want to wait a little bit until things crystallize a bit more and then take it up then. Just just a suggestion. Sorry, again, we, we've just started the collection of the revenue. Our, our biggest revenue category is the renewal fees. And so we've just started at the end of January collecting those renewal fees. So we won't really, I mean, we, we base our projections off of, of workload and revenue document that we work on every year based on our um, past year's accounting and uh, population of renewals or applications. And so it's always, it's an estimate, it's a snapshot in time, but it is, uh, it, as Dr. Witcher said, it is early on in this process where we just started collecting that revenue and we've only just collected the application revenue over the last three months. My, my assumption is, and my, my memory uh, tells me that the, uh, uh, the consultants that we utilize to look at and basically do a process audit for our licensing uh, had some basis for putting a fee of $800 onto the licensure by residency. We don't know for sure at this point what that process audit specifics were, but it wasn't just throwing darts at a board and saying, you know, most of them hit 400 or 800 or whatever. So I think we need to give it a little more time to flex itself out. If you look at the number of licenses by residency that were issued in 17 and we reduced the fee from 800 to 400, that would make about a $6,000 difference. Not a, not a major difference, okay? but. At the same time, we're starting to make uh, adjustments to something that hasn't really had a chance to get into the flow. So I think we might be wise to take a note of this and something that we need to keep an eye on, but not to make any changes or recommendation for changes at this point. Yeah, and I would agree you know, with that assessment that Dr. Witcher and Dr. Morrow mentioned. Um, however, I do want to have that noted in the minutes that we do need to look at it because it does give that perception of not fair and not justifiable. Dr. Morrow, are you comfortable with crafting a um, motion that, that uh, will encapsulate? 
Office yes, uh, I'm comfortable with drafting a motion <laughs> <laughs> off the top of my head uh, that uh, we that we uh, are aware. Move that the board go on record of being aware that the licensing fee for licensure through the resident pathway uh, is something that we need more information on and that we would gather information and make a decision moving forward uh, relating to any adjustments on that fee. Okay. Mary McCune, California Dental Association. Uh, we wanted to, we appreciate that you guys are opening this discussion again. We want to make sure that at whatever point you guys do consider rulemaking, um, that any adjustments are equitable. And we also want to keep into consideration the financial solvency of the dental board as well. Um, other member comments that we've received are the, the extreme increase from a couple hundred dollars to $2,000 for the GACS um, uh, permit. So we just wanted, if you guys are going to take that in consi into consideration for the residency um, at some point, <laughs> just putting that out there as well. So thank you. Yes. Agenda item 6G, uh, discussion, discussion and possible action regarding uh, the regular rulemaking to amend California Code of Regulations. Uh, Title 16, Section 1049, relating to more mobile and portable dental units. Um, staff presented revised language at the August 2017 meeting for the board's consideration, which was approved un unanimously. However, after receiving feedback from the California Dental Hygienists Association and the Dental Hygiene Committee of California, board staff revised the approved language after meeting with CDA and the Department of Consumer Affairs Legal Counsel, so our board's legal counsel. Uh, therefore, board staff is presenting amended proposed language at this meeting for the board's consideration to continue the regular rulemaking process. So we're just asking that the board consider and possibly accept the amended proposed regulatory language relative to the registration requirements for a mobile and portable dental unit and direct staff to take all necessary steps to continue the full the formal rulemaking process, including noticing the proposed language for 45-day public comment, setting the proposed language for a public hearing, and authorizing the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package. Um, if after the close of the 45-day public comment period and public regulatory hearing, no adverse comments are received, authorizing the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the proposed regulations before completing the rulemaking process and adopting the proposed amendments to California Code Regulations, Title 16, Section 1049, as noticed in the proposed text.
Dr. Witcher? Yeah, I'd like to move to accept that. Sarah, did you want to have a comment or uh, we need public comment? The whole time. Just push it the whole time. Mm -hmm. Just the whole time. Hi. My name is Elliot Schlang, and I am a provider of in-school. I'm a provider of in-school dental care uh, in California. My program is called Big Smiles California. I started this program ten years ago, and in 2007, in 2007, we saw a couple of hundred children in the program. Uh, due to um, uh, schools finding that they f um, um, the health the he the schools concerned with the health care provided to children um, they've been engaging more in um, in uh, contracting with health care providers to provide in school services over the last ten years my program has grown substantially and in 2017. Uh, we saw 60,000 children in California. We provided approximately 60,000 sealants and 25,000 fillings and uh, tried to motivate as many children as possible to take better care of their teeth. Uh, over the last 10 years, I've been working with uh, academicians and state, uh, California state regulators, uh, the Department of Health Care Services, and Delta Dental in um, improving the method, uh, the method in which my program is, has been operating. Um, uh, I'm also part of a national program where in 2000, it's called uh, Smile America Partners, where in 2017, in 18 states, we saw 500,000 children. Um, the reason why I'm, um, I've, I've come here was that last week, uh, Gail Matthew of the California Dental Association uh, told me that this matter was going to be taken up today, and she asked me to look over the proposed regulations to see um, if there was anything in, in them that, that concerned me. Uh, I, I believe that the proposed regulations will help to um, uh, ensure that uh, in-school dentistry and other mobile and portable dentistry programs, whether they be in nursing homes or elsewhere, will be very well, um, um, uh, uh, the, the processes that are used will be, uh, the legislation, the regulations will be very helpful to ensure that everything is done properly. There was one matter which was uh, which is of great concern. Oh, um, I, I just wanted to throw in that besides the 60,000 children that, that the program saw in California, um, I, I personally provided 2,000 of the fillings that were, that were done. Um, the matter that in the regulations, which was of great concern to me that I saw the, uh, which was missing is that there was no provision for the digitally, recor digitally recorded and preserved verbal consent. Whereas in K-1, it talks about uh, consent for services and signed consent. Uh, there is no provision for digitally recorded cons consent. And this cr uh, would create a, a pretty big problem to the program. Uh, basically, for our program to operate, we, we send flyers home with children. These flyers are then come back to our program, and we have to call the parents to be able to fill in the blanks that, um, that the parents left. 
And in, when we do fill in the blanks, we digitally record and preserve that digital recording. Also, um, a few months ago, I signed an agreement with UCLA, whereas UCLA students will be coming out in our visits and providing preventive and restorative services. And we need to call the parents who are uh, uh, patients of record in our program and get permission for the UCLA students to provide these services. And we were going to uh, uh, get this permission by digitally recorded consent. Um, what I would like the uh, board to consider is um, a slight uh, change in the sentence of K-1, consent for services and have it read, no dental service, including dental examination or disease prevention services, shall be performed on a patient without signed written consent or digitally recorded and preserved verbal consent. Um, if though, if, if with that in the regulation, um, I, the, re the regulation reads very well to me, and uh, I would be very satisfied with that. Without that, it would, uh, I think it would um, be a burden on my program and also deny access to many children um, uh, for, for dental services, many underserved children. Thanks. So I wanted to clarify, when you collect the digitally uh, recorded consent, how is that where it, uh, I guess many other organizations can use that, um, maybe not in a, in a positive way, probably to go back and, and just input the information in case they're being audited or so forth. So I'm curious, how would we verify that it's well, legitimate? I, I, that's when we digitally record consent, we have a, a uh, call center, and the call center works by script, and it reads the qu the question. The it reads a paragraph and a question to the parent, and the parent answers the question, and then the outbound caller or the or the person on the call with the parent then reads back what the parent agreed to, and then that continues until. Uh, the process is completed and that recorded consent is preserved and also a written version of it is placed in the patient's chart so that when w when we go into a school and we get the record we have um, we have what we have consent for and also the health history etc So as a pediatric dentist, um, we do have some complexities with um, consent. So I understand having the ability to digitally record a consent, but the complexities become even more complex when you can either do the diagnosis but then you also have the complexities of verifying if you've never met the parent and doing anything invasive. So there's one complexity there. And if you've never met the parent, you have a question of validation of that truly is the parent that's giving you consent. The other complexity that comes into play is either divorced families or non um, legally married parents where one parent apparently gives you consent but the other parent doesn't give you consent. So there's greater complexities that we have to look at for something like that. Okay. When a grandparent brings in a child, they may not have the ability to give consent either. Again, you've never met the parent. So does that put you at risk? Yes, it can. We run into this on a daily basis. Um, 
one thing that my program doesn't do is we, we don't use any anxiety re relieving um, medication whatsoever. So at, um, we don't, at least we don't have to deal with the, the, the consent of medication. But yes, it is confusing sometimes who is the legal guardian of that parent. However, I believe that we put in as great an effort as any dental office puts in to verify that the person that we are speaking to when we do get verbal consent is the, is the legal guardian. Um, usually if we're outbound calling, the school has provided us with the, with the phone number for the parent, and that's the phone number that we call. Or if a parent calls us to enroll with the parent, uh, uh, to enroll, we verify with the school that that child's a patient of record and who that child is. When a child is, is seen by us, the school verifies that the child has, has, um, is, is a child of the school and that we did receive consent. So we're working not only with the legal guardian, but with the surrogate guardian of the child, which is the school. Now, as far as your question is, is it the grandmother or is it the aunt? When um, in a dental office, when someone brings a child in for services and they say they are the legal guardian, usually there is not a, um, a formal request of, of proof, such as um, whatever document you might need to prove that you are the parent of that person. Um, the processes that we go through on verbal consent are, I believe, equivalent or more thorough than a dental office does by just someone registering as a patient and, 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 um, and uh, saying that they are the legal guardian. But in the cases that we're talking about, the reason why we're in the school is that the school is complaining that the school nurse has been trying, we're safety net, the school nurse has been trying to get these children into dental offices for long period, unsuccessfully for long periods of time through contact with the parent. This safety net, which only sees approximately 10% of, of the population of each school, which is in each school we go to, is highly, uh, has a high Medicaid en enrollment in the school. We are the safety net program for kids who are not taken to dental offices. And I totally agree, a dental home would be, the, would be better than a virtual dental home, which I provide. But it's still, it provide, there's 500, 5 million children in California covered under, under Medicaid. And there, are, there, are, there is very low utilization for uh, in terms of the number, the percentage of these medication, Medicaid children compared to middle class children who are taken in for services. We're doing the best we can under the circumstances to provide um, fillings, um, uh, preventive dentistry, and oral hygiene instruction to these children. And these children would not be a, a able to have these services if it weren't for us. Um, there is there's only so much you can do to to make sure that it's inf infallible. And I believe we're doing everything that we can. And to have a written consent, um, let's say, supersede the validity of a digitally recorded verbal consent, I don't think it would be fair because this written consent essentially comes by messenger of a child going to their home, someone signing it and coming back. I believe the digitally recorded consent that we have is more valid than that. Not that that, that form that comes back signed is, is not valid, but I believe digitally recorded consent under the circumstances that we're operating in is about as best you can do. I just wanted some clarification. 
um, I have had things um, where I've done by telephone and you do your transaction or you state what it is you want and then there is a separate question that you have to answer yes or no to and, and that is I want to confirm that on this date you have done this. Is that a part of what you do or are you just recording? No, that is a part of what we do and everything that's recorded is then read back to the parent to confirm that they that they this is what they agreed to. So you're essentially asking reviewing everything twice and you're recording the the date and time of the of the call. So if that's the case, I don't have an issue with this. But what if others do not follow that same guideline? And, and how will it be written if they follow it? Because we could have this organization that's doing it properly, but then we'll, how can we ensure that other organizations are also doing it that way? Um, I would suggest additional language then because I, I, I wrote the, the board a letter yesterday, and in one paragraph it says, in my experience, systems can be put into place to ensure the integrity of consent process through, such as through authentication, concurrent recording of date and time, linking call information to electronic health records for easy retrie retrieval, ensuring electronic records are maintained securely and that redundancies are installed to ensure information is not lost. Uh, I don't know if, if, if the absolute detail uh, of that uh, needs to be in the regulation, but certainly a sentence that um, requires that the most up-to-date electronically recorded, digitally recorded, a verbal consent systems be used can be can be inserted there, and that would I would be pleased to, to see that all other operations that are similar to mine operate in the same way. I'm going to go ahead and recognize Mary McCune, who's um, at the table to speak as well, and then we'll go to Dr. Chan. Uh, Mary McCune, CDA. I just wanted to say thank you to Allison and Sarah for helping us. Um, we've been working on the regulation language for quite a long time, and um, so far we, we just were able to read it earlier this week. Um, our first glance, we're, we're very pleased with the language. We'll be offering a couple technical non-substantive changes during public comment if um, that process is um, started from this meeting. Uh, we also will be reviewing um, the verbal, the digitally recorded consent piece, um, and we'll be considering that in our public comment as well. First of all, your company that's trying to address access is laudable. The intent of trying to work through consent is laudable. But the reality is, is that let me take the piece of having the verbal consent. There are times when we, as a pediatric dentist, get a verbal consent, but it's with not proceeding with anything that's invasive, any kind of restorative work. It's relationships. So when we do the verbal consent, it's with a known parent. The parent knows who you are. You know who the parent is. But in this case, you don't know who the parent is. It's not about knowing, it's about the relationship that that person gives that trust to you. So it's going in a, um, an area where there's uncertainty of that one case where um, you may not have the parent there. You didn't have the eye to eye contact with that parent to say, you have consent to treat my child. I'm giving you my child for the safety of what you're going to render. It's not just the technical execution of that function. 
No, I, I hear you loud and clear. And in 50 years ago, when, well, maybe 60 years ago when I was a child, um, um, schools required um, my parents to uh, have me bring in a form saying either I didn't, from, from my dentist, that I didn't need dental care or I was in the process of getting dental care. And then when my dental care was completed, I would bring that into, into the school. There was no child in, uh, I went to public school, there was no child in the school that did not comply with that. Um, we're in a different situation where we have school nurses who cannot get children who complain on a daily basis of tooth pain to get into care. And that, what, what is, that created the necessity for the program that I have. We don't have the eye to eye contact with the parent. But on the same, on the other hand, the parent is not taking the child to the dentist for whatever reason that child is not arriving in a dental office and we're there to, to, to help and provide the care. We saw 500,000 children last year. We saw maybe 450,000 children nationwide the year before. There are, there's not that many hiccups in this. We have a quality assurance program that, that not only reviews the, den uh, the charts, but receives calls on a daily basis of parents' concerns. There are things that happen, but it's very rare. So I would, I would answer you that I'd love to see the clock turn back to what it was a long time ago, where in every single case, you have a, you have a child and a parent and eye-to-eye -eye contact with the dentist. This safety net program that we're operating, I think is being done very responsibly and in hand in hand with acad academicians and regulators. And I believe that it, it, it is something of, of great value that uh, should be supported and that um, because of what would be ideal is not there is really not a, re a reason to deny this access for the children. Sir, respectfully, I'm going to, I, I have another board member that it wants to be heard and I'm going to ask a, let me see. I commend you. I commend you for providing this access to care. Um, it is very hard to learn when you have a toothache. As a matter of fact, it's very hard to do anything when you have pain. So let alone, um, you know, helping to alleviate that pain so that children can learn and not be behind in school is very commendable. Now, with that said, I understand that we're in the 21st century. We are in a different time period. And it appears to me that in a perfect world, yes, you develop a relationship between the parent and the dental, but that's not the real world here. And we have a lot of low income uh, children that we cannot ignore. And we're not going to get to that point of having a parent dental rela den dentist relationship we need to uh, address the problem as it stands let's we'd like to have it but we don't and so i i see the trade off i understand the trade off but i understand the trade off of having a kind of program that you and others provide being of greater benefit than the small hiccup down the road. And, and I would, I see no problems with this, and I do see, um, uh, thank you for the additional language as well. So that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, let me see if I can <clears throat> suggest something here, and I'll ask for Allison and Sarah's help on this. <clears throat> 
Uh, perhaps what we should do is move this forward, post it for rulemaking, and accept your information as a written comment, in which case we'll have time to look at it and get it reviewed. Uh, to take this up when we've only just gotten this is a little hard to do. In an interest of moving the process forward, I think this would allow your point to be considered and amended language developed, and if need be, it'll come back to us for approval. Uh, the other thing is hold off, take the comment up front, develop language, and come back at another meeting. So it's sort of an administrative thing, but you will have the opportunity to comment one way or the other. <coughs> Just to clarify what Dr. Witcher said, I think he is outlining your options. You can move forward and accept the language as it's presented to you without the amendment that Dr. Schlang is suggesting. And then once the package actually goes out and starts the 45-day comment period, Dr. Schlang would be able to put his comments in writing, at which time the board would have to respond to him in writing whether or not they would accept that language moving forward. Do the, does the board understand that? Will it come back to the board? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Dr. Chan. So just for the record, wearing my other hat when I was at CDA, I was actually the driver of the legislation that required um, a kindergarten um, screening for a dental exam before you got into kindergarten to identify what the need was first before you went after it. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, um, I've been working with the Los Angeles Unified School District for the last 10 years. And I'm sorry, for Dr. The, Schlang, I'm sorry, at this point, I don't think we need. Well, the kindergarten initiative that he mentioned, it's on, it's on the books but the schools are having a very hard time getting compliance with it, and they've approached me for help with having these children who are supposed to have a kindergarten screening. They don't get the screening. Would someone like to make a motion that we... That so I'll, I'll move that we go ahead and post uh, the proposed regulatory uh, package for rulemaking as outlined by Allison. Anthony Lum, Dental Hygiene Committee. I just want to commend your staff and thank you all for working with us in the revision of the language that you have presented before you. Thanks. We're going to vote on this motion. Uh, Burton. I thought about passing and coming back but I'd like some amendment to that to say that um, we heard these comments and we're aware of the significance of them or something to that effect. I don't th I, I'm not sure. I'll check with Michael as to whether or not the motion needs to be amended, but the minutes will reflect that Dr. Slane gave testimony and that the board um, uh, acknowledges his comments and essentially requests that he uh, submit his comments during the formal rulemaking process. Right, I'd, I'd agree. There's, in order to move this forward so that we can begin the, the regulatory process, there's, there's no need to put any, any mention about the comments because uh, as was stated previously, there still will be the 45-day uh, comment period where everyone will be able to comment, and those comments would still come back to the board for approval. And if at that time there are any suggested changes to the proposed regulatory language, that's when it can be made. So this isn't the first and the last time the board will see this. 
Okay, let me start again. Burden? Yes. Chan? Aye. Chappelle Ingram? A. Lai? Yes. Le? Yes. Medina? Yes. Morrow? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Witcher? Yes. Mr. President, motion. Thank you very much for for listening. Thank you. Agenda item 6H, discussion and possible action regarding an emergency rulemaking to amend California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1005, relating to minimum standards of, for infection control in compliance with Assembly Bill 1277. Uh, so at the November 2017 board meeting, board staff presented proposed language for the board's consideration to initiate the emergency rulemaking that reflected the authority granted by Assembly Bill 1277. Um, board staff deferred to um, CDA because uh, board members expressed concern over the presented language citing that it would result in unforeseen consequences uh, because the wording presented was all-encompassing and would impose a burden to dentists who may invade or expose dental pulp unintentionally. Um, and so the board unan unanimously approved the revised language presented by CDA staff. Um, staff drafted the initial emergency rulemaking documents and submitted the documents to um, DCA Legal Affairs. Um, and Legal Affairs expressed concern regarding the board-approved language um, and discuss that with the board's executive officer and assistant executive officer in December. Um, so we are here today to present amended proposed language at this February meeting for the board's consideration to continue the emergency rulemaking process uh, that reflects the authority granted by Assembly Bill 1277. So pursuant to Government Code 11346.5, we are asking that they adopt the uh, that the board adopt the amended proposed regulatory language relative to minimum standards for infection control and direct staff to take all steps necessary to continue the emergency rulemaking process, including noticing the proposed language for five days and authorizing the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the emergency rulemaking package before completing the emergency rulemaking process. Board comment, Dr. Morrow. <clears throat> I move the acceptance of the regulatory package as presented. Now second. Board comment, questions? Public comment? Mary McCune, CDA. Uh, we just wanted to reiterate that the proposed regulatory language submitted by CDA reflects Assembly Daly's legislative intent by specifying that only the fluids used during irrigation of the exposed pulp and not, <clears throat> and not the entire procedure itself shall be sterile or contain disinfecting or antibacterial agents. Uh, CDA and Assembly Daly's concern with providing greater clarity comes from hearing from dentists that there's, there may be some confusion on this matter that could result in un unintended consequences of requiring all, all water used uh, during any procedure that may expose a dental pulp to meet these um, sterility or antibacterial requirements. Um, we also wanted to note that next week, CDA and representatives from Assemblymember Daly's office will be meeting with DCA Deputy Council to talk about this more, um, hopefully to find some regulatory resolution to this. Uh, we want to try to avoid having a legislative resolution, so we wanted to keep you guys um, informed about that as well. Uh, Dr. Guy Atchison, California Academy of General Dentistry. Yep. The, um, there is tremendous confusion on this with the alternative to sterile water, irrigants, the water that contains disinfectants or antibacterial properties, which has no standard. Um, so I'm asking where that standard is going to come from if we have water systems. Our office has a, a disinfect water disinfection system 
for all the water that goes to all the units, but will it meet the intent of this law? I don't have any way of knowing. The manufacturer is not going to say yes or no. Do I have to do water testing myself on a regular basis? I think there needs to be a lot of clarification on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was a lot of question about, you know, imposing a requirement like this across the 38,000 licensees that we have out there, um, whether they had the capability to do this. I mean, every time you pick up a handpiece and work on a tooth, potentially you'll have to use sterile irrigation if you take it literally. And um, I just don't know that that's feasible. So I think there's a lot of questions here. I mean, the, the intent of the uh, CDA's proposal was to make the language more specific. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to have run afoul of the APA standards by doing that somehow. Um, we have, what, until the end of the year to enact emergency regs. Uh, maybe we shouldn't post this for rulemaking right away, but give them a little time to see if we can work something out with DCA legal first. I just, I think it, it might, we might run into compliance problems if, if we get the cart before the horse here, it'd be my concern. Yes, there, there is a question on whether or not the water that's coming out with disinfectants um, meet any kind of standard at all. And apparently what happens on the MSDSs is, is that on the instructions for a lot of the disinfectants, it says refer to the manufacturer, which doesn't help you. Just a quick clarifying uh, comment about the board's deadline. There's no, there's no requirement or a deadline to pursue emergency rulemaking uh, at this time. What the deadline is from the statute is for the board to adopt final regulations on or before December 31, 2018. So the emergency rulemaking process is a vehicle that the board can use, um, but there's no deadline to actually implement or go through emergency rulemaking. So that's, that's just the deadline for the board to keep in mind. Uh, I, CDA would respectfully ask the board to consider delaying initiating the emergency rulemaking, um, at least until after we're able to convene with Assemblymember Daly's office and DCA legal to see if there is a way that we could adopt um, either the originally proposed language from CDA, some other type of language, or if there's a legislative route that we could circumvent having to um, go through the emergency rulemaking process for the actual legislation from last year. Just, just to clarify, so the language that we're putting in regulations is statutory language, right? But Mary, you have indicated that you're not gonna try to change the statute. So I'm not really clear how waiting. That we Michael. haven't committed to, to not changing the statutory language. We, we're waiting until we meet with them to see if it's gonna be a legislative route or a regulatory route that we can use to, to address the issue. It, it could be introducing another bill, going through omnibus, something like that. We just don't know what that is yet. Okay, so Michael, with based on the discussions we've had, with the current statute as it stands, this essentially is the regulatory route. Th there wouldn't be a change in regulatory language. This is the this is the regulatory route. So right, ba based on how the statute was written, this is. The, the route that we have to take in order for it to go through and get approved by the Office of Administrative Law. Because this, wasn't, this isn't one of those statutes where it sets out the rule. The statute basically told the board, here's what you gotta do, make the rule. And the statute sets out the exact language. So that's the language the board has to follow. Uh, therefore, there, there really isn't another alternative in terms of the regulatory process because of how this particular statute is worded. Then I would amend my request for a legislative alternative, if feasible, to delay, consider delaying the emergency rulemaking to see if there's a legislative pathway that we could use. 
Well, and, and I would just comment that there, uh, the two could go simultaneously. I mean, the board could accept the language because this is what we have to work with now and show good faith that we're trying to comply with the statute as, as it was developed by Mr. Daly and so that we're not uh, trying to impede the process in any way while at the same time stakeholders can go ahead and see if the statute can be changed because the board can withdraw this at any time. But if, if we, if the board drops this at this point, I, I would rather it not come back that the board isn't trying to comply with the statute that stands now because we don't know whether stakeholders will be successful in trying to change it. Does Dr. Morrow? <clears throat> it is my understanding that uh, what our executive officer stated was the reason why I moved to address the rulemaking as it is presented. Because the way the statute reads, at this point in time, we have no choice. And I think it's important that we start this ball rolling through the process. And it can be pulled, it can be revised, it can be changed. But as it is now, we do not have any choice. And I think it's time that we started moving on this. So if it is appropriate, I call the question. Um, Dr. Guy Atches in California Academy of General Dentistry. So just to be clear, if this goes through the way it is, then this board is going to be responsible for defining what antibacterial and disinfectant properties the irrigant has to meet as an alternative to sterile water. Yes or no? In terms of uh, of how the enforcement goes, it's still going to be on a case by case. So there's no, unless the board wants to put in those standards. But uh, the way that it's reading in terms of recognized disinfecting or anti antibacterial properties—that's the phrase that you're referring to, correct? Correct. Okay. So that's why, if they, if the board wants to say you have to meet this particular one from this one, as long as they can point to a recognized one and that it's out there, they can still do it on a case-by-case -case basis and no regulations will be required because it's only if you have a general rule of application that the board's gonna need to have regulations developed further. See, when people read this law, they stop reading at sterile water. And there's a very different standard between sterile water and an irrigant that has antibacterial or antimicrobial properties. They're, they're not equivalent in any way. So that's where this confusion comes in. I'd say that's a great argument for you to be working with CDA and go back to the author and say, maybe we can repeal this section and start over. And in so doing, should you choose to do that, if the language could be written clearly enough so that a regulation wouldn't need to be done in an emergency fashion or otherwise, I think that would solve all the problems. Okay, we are making a motion on 6H um, to, accept to accept the regulatory language as presented here. Thank you. Burton. Aye. Chan. Aye. Chappelle Ingram. Yes. Lai. Yes. Lay. Yes. Medina. Yes. Morrow. No. Stewart. No. Witcher. Mr. Ms. We have motion passes.
President Stewart. Could I have the privilege of, after the fact, I believe at the time that the board was reviewing this uh, legislation, that there was an attempt to made to clarify that confusion regarding uh, involving the Pope in the, in the statute itself, and that was unsuccessful in getting any change. And I believe that we are now struggling with that. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. I'm Karen Fisher, Executive Officer of the Dental Board of California, and I'm going to be giving the update regarding the status of the dental school in Moldova that currently has a two-year provisional approval. Um, if you've read your memo, it essentially outlines that the school, we have been working closely with the school to uh, try to comply with the deficiencies that have been outlined. The school has been very responsive in submitting additional documentation as we go through the process. The latest package uh, or a package that was submitted was reviewed by the uh, site evaluation team and they determined that deficiencies still existed. The school was notified and I can let you know that yesterday morning we received already a response to the deficiencies and the uh, site evaluation team will now be uh, looking further at the documentation that has been presented. The deficiencies are outlined on page two of your memo. Basically the information that was submitted, some of it was not in English and most of it essentially was not readable because it was transmitted via uh, the internet and the scanned copies were not clear. I just had an opportunity to look at the information on my phone yesterday afternoon and it appears that the information submitted now is in English and is clear so we will be forwarding that to the site evaluation team for further evaluation. That concludes my report unless Dr. Morrow has anything he would like to add. No, only that uh, as I, I also received that information uh, actually came through on my cell phone as I was driving down here yesterday afternoon. So I have not had a chance to other than very superficially uh, review the information that we received uh, on my cell phone. So definitely we will, the uh, site visit team will be reviewing that uh, submitted documentation and get a report back to the executive officer as soon as possible. Comment? Senator Planko, you have to hold the button down while you're talking. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the board. Thank you very much. Uh, we have responded to the four areas of deficiency. We believe that uh, the response uh, we hope would meet uh, the criteria uh, and, and the, addresses the concerns of the site committee and this board. Uh, we would ask that if there is uh, uh, any additional uh, request uh, pertaining, uh, if uh, this, is, this is a new process. Uh, the forms uh, are, are, are new. Uh, it's a new process for all of us in the sense that this board is reviewing it for the most part for the first time. Uh, the assessment on, we want to definitely uh, address the issue of the assessments on the pediatric and geriatric patient care. Those are not listed as one of the 14 standards in the CCR. However, they are incorporated into I'm sorry. Uh, that would be uh, one of the critical areas that we definitely like the board to, uh, to look at, uh, again, the CCR identifies 14 standards. Within those standards, the issue of geriatric and uh, pediatric are addressed, are integrated, uh, are tested, and, and uh, 
Uh, we want to make sure that uh, that being one of the four uh, issues, I think that was of concern vis-a-vis -vis the standards. The, uh, the other th three items, the forms are translated in English. Uh, the student uh, information was not legible. It is legible. Uh, for all intent and purpose, uh, they are before you. We would ask that, uh, uh, if possible, we would ask that it be reviewed uh, as quickly as possible. We're eager. We're eager in wanting to meet the requirements and make sure that all the safety issues are addressed and the standards are addressed. And so we would ask that if the board does come back with an early uh, decision, uh, that uh, we be informed uh, of that. And uh, uh, pending the final outcome from this board, uh, we would appreciate uh, any consideration in expediting the matter. We appreciate your time and effort to the site team, Dr. Morrow, uh, and to the executive officer and to this board. We appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Planca. I have a question. Uh, Senator, um, how many, st the graduating class, what, how many students are there um, out of each approximately out of each class that were that maybe are or even contemplating coming to the United States I just I just just for curiosity how many students and why would they want to come here number of students I can get back to you the the number they're wanting to come there the tuition is much less uh, the standards will be equivalent to California standards. Therefore, upon graduating, coming from a foreign school with the standards that have been approved, allow them to take the exam. Uh, as you know, existing law uh, requires foreign trained dentists who are not uh, trained in an accredited school university must take the additional two year uh, program. Uh, and so the advantages that are brought here are the following. Lower tuition, equivalent standards by this board uh, that are established, five-year program meeting those standards with all the accountability in place, no different than a California university or a private dental school, and the opportunity to really come out without uh, substantial debt, if you will. So, so the, uh, we're just talking about California. So have, have you approached any other states? No. We, we have not approached any other states. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> if I could respond, Dr. Lai, to your, to your question. The, uh, the site visit team requested 20, the records of 20 randomly selected students that graduated in the class of 2017. That request of 20 students was chosen because it represents approximately 10% of the graduating students, which is a recognized sam random sample for, for statistic validity of testing a sample. So the reason why we asked for 20 record, 20 students records was to be consistent with standards for uh, uh, achieving a, a, a record amount, a, a statistically significant amount. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. I believe that concludes our business for this afternoon. We're in recess. Public comment. Oh, public comment, sorry. Just a quick public comment. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members of the board. My name is Melanie Rowe. I'm a CRNA, a certified registered nurse anesthetist. I'm here on behalf of the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists. And uh, as I, we understood that you guys have a lot of work on your plate, but this morning definitely illustrates that. So I just want to say that uh, we look forward to conversations that we have with you in the future um, when you guys have time. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. The public session will recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. 
the board will be uh, attending a lunch and coming back here in approximately an hour and a half. Say 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, we'll resume in closed session.